Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to beautiful downtown Grand Forks, the proud home of the University of North Dakota. This is the time and place for the Grand Forks City Council uh, Jobs Development Authority. Uh, begin with a uh, roll call, please. Michael? Here. 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 Very good. Item 2.1 hold a public hearing and take action on the request to authorize re roofing the hive to 375 Second Avenue North. Ms. Richards. Thank you, uh, Mr. Weber. Um, as you just said, the request here is to re roof this facility. Uh, normally, we would, um, for a project of this magnitude, hire an architect to develop plans and specs and go through a standard competitive bidding process. Um, that was the plan. We had $200,000 in the budget to do that. Um, however, the roof deteriorated pretty rapidly um, this last winter and spring. As you probably saw in the Herald, we had some pretty good leakage a couple weekends ago. And so we are now requesting authorization to proceed with a re-roof through quotes. Um, we have contacted five firms received quotes from two. The low bidder um, or low quote was received from Tech America in the amount of $224,302. Um, this was uh, the lowest quote we received and seems to be sufficient to give us a good growth and they're able to, if awarded, um, get to work by mid-June. So um, this is kind of a times of the essence thing. Um, the, the, Photos that were attached to your staff report show how seriously that roof membrane has separated. So it's kind of a balloon rather than actually protecting the roof. So um, given those, what we're calling emergency situation that has developed so quickly, we're asking for you to recognize that emergency situation and authorize us to um, enter into a contract with Tech America and proceed. Very good. Let me uh, open a public hearing on item 2.1. Does anyone wish to speak to 2.1? Anyone wish to speak? We'll close the public hearing. Uh, JDA members, any comments or questions? Yeah, Chair Weber, just a quick question, Meredith. Um, you need two quotes. There's one for 224,000, one's almost double at 420. Was there any scope, scoping differences or major scoping differences, differences that would have made it that much different, I guess? Um, the, the higher quote did have a, a different, I guess, a higher quality membrane. Um, we've had both um, maintenance and inspections look at both quotes and been assured that the, the low quote is a perfectly acceptable roof. Um, both roofs come with a 15 year warranty, so we don't get a longer life necessarily out of the higher bid. I also think that higher bid is reflective of fact that and the fact that we didn't even get responses from others is that contractors right, are yeah it. more along the lines is for that we do it but it's probably yeah right. all right any further questions yes Ms. Lonsky, please. so was the two hundred thousand that was in the budget was that for the engineers or for the actual roof well that would have been the budget for the project <laughs> okay 200,000 is, is kind of that threshold for hiring an architect and competitively bidding it. Um, so you can see that we're right there and that normally we would go through that competitive bidding process. President Sandy. I think at 12% over our estimate to be able to get it done in this timeline seems reasonable. So I will move it through. Of motion for President Sanders. Second. second for Mayor Wachinski. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All the same sign. Motion, motion uh, passes unanimously. Motion to adjourn. Second for Mrs. Sasky. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Meeting aye. is adjourned. All right, moving on, I will call to order the Grand Fork City Council meeting for Monday, May 15th, 2023. Welcome, everybody, and roll call, please, Marie. Michael? Here. 
Thank you. Item 1.2, Pledge of Allegiance. We've got the Youth Commission here today, at least a couple of members. This is a pretty exciting group to have here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic in which it stands, one nation under God, and it is called the liberty and justice of all. And then, Catherine, you want to give a few words about the Youth Commission and what you guys have been working on? Absolutely. Thank you for hosting us tonight. So, my name is Catherine Galatch. I'm the Associate Superintendent of the Secondary Education at Grand Forks Public Schools. And you may be used to Sarah Schimmick stepping in for the Youth Commission, but she um, has taken a different position. So, I have been blessed with taking on the charge of working with these fine youth. Um, just a little bit of history is the Youth Commission. I'm not exactly sure how many years it's been around, but it was a a cooperative agreement uh, brought in by Mayor Brown with Grand Forks Public Schools to make sure that we were giving youth a voice in our community. And so we have spent at least monthly meetings together trying to figure out how we want to make an impact on the world and make Grand Forks and our schools within Grand Forks a better place. So each of these uh, young ladies is going to share with you just a little tidbit. And then if we have time and you want to do a, a spontaneous exercise with us, we'll do that at the end. So we'll do that to you now, okay? Uh, so Reagan is up first. Uh, my name is Reagan Salgado. I'm a senior at River right now. Uh, I just want to talk very briefly about what the Youth Commission has done in the past. I've been with the Youth Commission since sixth or seventh grade. And the thing that was really kicking off when I was joining the Youth Commission was the anti-vaping campaign that was all over Grand Forks. It was a big issue and still is a big issue. It was a great and influential campaign that really caused a difference. And then after that, we turned into our We Are Yes campaign, our Youth Against Stigma. Uh, we had t-shirts, we had summits, we really pushed this idea that addiction is a form of mental health, uh, a form of mental illness, and that solving addiction is a real problem, a real thing that can be done. So um, that was part of our, that was our pushes at the time. Right now, our push is on foster youth, especially young people who are moving from home to home without much stuff, and that's a serious issue in our community. Hi, my name is Jenna Shahal. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I joined Youth Commission. I joined because my counselor at South Middle School, uh, he told me about the Youth Commission and asked me if it's something I'd be interested in. And I thought it was really cool that I'd get to have a say of what we do in the community. And so I told him, sure, I'll try it out. So my first day there, I was a little bit nervous. There were a lot of kids. And so right when we started, we were doing all of these like exercises about speaking and um, stuff like that. So I got to know the people there a lot. And it's been really fun since. And I'm really proud of all the things that we've done in there. Hello, my name is Addison Foley, and I'm a 10th grader at Central right now. I would like to talk a little bit about um, our current campaign. We're putting together um, care packages for children in the foster care system. Um, these care packages include things that can sometimes be a luxury or hard to come by for people in the foster care system. Things like um, clothing, school supplies, toiletries, snacks, and general comfort items like blankets or stuffed animals. Um, we've reached out to a lot of local businesses and are working along with them. If anyone is interested in more information or donating monetarily or item-wise, um, information will be sent out through Ms. Cheryl. Um, any contributions or any just general help would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right, spontaneous exercise. Yeah, so as you can see, one of the things that we're, we've been working on is just this public speaking. So thank you for letting us exercise our wares there. Uh, but Ms. Salgado here uh, would be willing to demonstrate what we call the Toastmasters exercise. So Mr. Bill Voscheck, I see him sitting in the way back, has taught us how to um, engage in spontaneous public speaking. And we talk about the power of the vocal word and how we have to learn to advocate for ourselves as individuals, but more importantly, advocate for others in our community. And so in order to get to that 
end goal, we do these practice exercises, as Jen has mentioned. So Ms. Salgado here is willing to do a 30 second speech. I'm going to keep it quick because these are busy people. And Ms. Uh, Commissioner Lenski, would you be willing to present a topic to her on which she will speak for 30 seconds? It can be anything <laughs> under the sun. Reagan, you can come to the mic. I could tell this over pre plan. All right. Hurry <laughs> up, topic, topic. Let's go. Topic. Um, well, you guys got me thinking about the foster care system. So, can we continue with that theme? Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the big issues that we're seeing is not only a lack of foster care families, to my understanding, it's that they have to move around quickly, oftentimes, or if they have to leave their house and they don't have a chance to come back, that means they're going to lack things such as clothes, toiletries, snacks, comfort items. So, this is their stuff. This goes with them from home to home. It'll be a backpack, it'll be a duffel, it'll be something convenient, but also not glaringly obvious, such as a trash bag or something that could easily break. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. So again, thank you for uh, entertaining us tonight. I don't know if you have any questions for the youth or myself, but we do appreciate the work that you do advocating for our city as well. All right, let's give them one more up. Wait, Mr. Yes, Murray's right. got one question. Please. It's, it's, it's impressive how much information you were able to put in 30 seconds. Thank you. Yes, thank yes. you. Well done. Let's give one more round of applause. Thank you. All right, item 1.3, Mayor's announcements. Get that page out. I was happy to get uh, the state of the city address done. Uh, earlier, well, I guess last week. Um, thank you all the sponsors, everyone that attended that. It turned out to be a great event. Uh, special thank you to President Armacost, uh, Todd for Forkel, and Colonel Del Rivera for coming up on stage, up on stage, and, and joining the, joining us in the fun. So, thank you everybody for that. That was the first time to do it in person. Now, uh, the previous one I had done uh, virtually. So, definitely enjoy it uh, being in person much more. Uh, on to the fire department, I want to congratulate. We had uh, a record. We had nine new recruits that were just sworn in. Uh, we did that just last week as well, and four uh, very important promotions. So thank you to Chief Lorenz and all the trainers over there to get uh, get those crews ready and get them out to their station. So that's phenomenal. Uh, looking ahead, uh, our public works department, our, our sanitation and street crews, uh, will be getting spring cleanup uh, starting Monday. So it's going to be generally the same day as your as your garbage pickup. So it can change a little bit just based on the amount of waste that's there at each house. Um, I'm actually going to be out on Wednesday helping out. So if you got Wednesday trash day, you can uh, you might get to see the mayor out there picking some stuff up and maybe keeping a few things for myself. Just depends on the just, uh, just, just the heavy things. Yeah, they got me working on that. So uh, that's something I always enjoy doing. Uh, and then just a, a fun fact: we're going to talk about uh, the electronic recycling event that happened uh, on May 16th on Saturday. And you wonder if these things are well attended and how much stuff you bring in, but there was 11.45 tons of electronics. So that's 22,900 pounds. So I'm glad I wasn't there to do the heavy lifting that day, let's put it that way. So that's all we've got for mayor's announcements. So we'll move on to item two, citizen comments. I have four comments tonight. Um, Mona Lee. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that the sleep, please. Yeah, it's on. Thank you. Mona Lake 3231 Ward Circle, which is Ward 7. And good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, I'd like to speak to the citizens' comment policy, and I'll make it brief. I have three points. I believe it would be uh, practical to have the comments at the committee of the whole. And I think Mr. V mentioned this earlier, and I think this would help for council people to, to listen and hear and also take into account their decisions at the next meeting. And uh, number two, uh, then citizens comments at the beginning of the regular council meeting, because this would give the uh, citizens an opportunity to have a, a second opportunity to speak if they weren't able to make it to the first. Uh, number three, and my final point is, I would like to see the early sign-in uh, eliminated, the early sign-in policy eliminated. Um, basically, it's really hard for people, to, especially some occupations who punch a clock uh, to get here. And also you have 
young couples, families that have to pick up childcare, children at childcare. They're not going to make it here before 5.30. So you're eliminating a large group of people with this 5.30 deadline. And then uh, finally, the council meetings used to be after six o'clock. And I know that's quite a while ago, and I can't remember the particular time. Perhaps some of the older members on the council do remember. And they changed it to five o'clock. When they changed it to five o'clock, I was very concerned. And the reason for that is that it eliminates so many different occupations in this town who cannot participate with the meeting at five o'clock. So they cannot run for council seats. We talk about having members having members just run. Well, right there, we're eliminating a large group of people. That is a, a big percentage of this community. So um, I would like uh, to have that, at least have that sign-in eliminated, and maybe in the future consider moving the council meetings to a, a later time. We might get more participation for citizens and might see some new faces on this council. Uh, at least it provides an opportunity for occupations that don't have the leeway all of you do. And I think that's that's a critical point. That's a big, large chunk of our population that do not have your flexibility. So I certainly hope you will consider this and at least eliminate the 530 and continue <laughs> comments. Boy, I got the point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Jason Patrick. Yes, Jason. Uh, the Michelle, I'm the Mr. Boucher, please. It's been a hot minute since I've been up here. Now, Gabby? Got me good? Anybody? All right. Good evening, City Council, Mayor, and the electorate. This evening, the topic of freedom of speech uh, and expression is under fire, and such a state has existed since members of this council pushed back against comments made some weeks ago. And while I cannot condone the topics brought up, by a citizen, nor the fervor tone and anger that has been levied against this council, I can certainly understand to an extent the building of emotions and tension that has led to outbursts seen at these meetings. And while this may not justify those actions to continue down the path of this discussion of limiting people's voice without leadership in this room acknowledging their own hand in the situation reaching the levels of tension, which it is is not only irresponsible, but is a brazen display of some of the absolute worst leadership I have per personally witnessed and appears more akin to retaliation, retaliation excuse me, than to an effort to maintain good order and discipline on the floor of the citizens' council chambers. Much like Icarus flying close to the sun, your efforts to stifle the voice of the people flirts with entirely too much intimacy, that insidious mistress of power that is totalitarianism. This council treads a fine line running up a slippery slope by entertaining the question of who has a right to speak at these meetings, especially after it was the efforts of citizens from outside this community who tried to open your eyes to your blind pursuit of welcoming, welcoming an adversarial nation into our community. If it had not been for the efforts and actions of people from outside this community, whom would never have been allowed past the gatekeepers, the city administrator, or the mayor to speak here, that project would have continued and sensitive missions would have been placed at risk. If you limit the topics to which citizens may speak on, you stifle accountability. And may I remind you that it is the electorate to which you are accountable. And to take that hallowed spot of earth, excuse me, that hallowed spot of earth before you from the people is an act of cowardice. If you are to pursue limitations, I suggest strongly to you that you pursue only limitations specifically related to the conduct not only of the electorate who stand before you, but the conduct of yourselves as leaders of this city. When you raised your right hand and you swore your oaths, you accepted freely and without reservation or pursuit of personal gain, all that which comes with this position, the good and the bad, the praise for success and the harshest lashings of ridicule at your failures and mistakes. I remind you, 
of this without any lightheartedness and with a seriousness that can only be forged in the crucible of leadership and service. You willingly accepted the burden of service of leadership. With that also comes the burden of setting the example. You were supposed to be the very essence of what right looks like. And in being such, you should, without reservation, hold yourselves to a higher standard than those to which you would hold over the electorate and far steeper consequences than you would have the citizen's shoulder in the event of your failure to uphold those very standards. I ask you to consider these things. I take leadership very, very seriously. That's because I have led and I have been led in some of the most harshest conditions where leadership costs lives. So I look at this very, very seriously and I hold my leaders to incredibly hard standards because of that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Patrick. Bernie Sanders. Mr. Sander, please. Hey, good evening, Bernie Sander. Uh, just a comment about uh, moving around the city council uh, citizens' comments. It was brought up uh, talking about agenda items only. We can't have that because what I'm going to bring forward right now is a prime example. End of February, first part of March, the uh, city broke a gutter over on a piece of property in Grand Forks. I called it in a month and a half ago. Well, the last snowstorm, same property, they broke the curb. The homeowner has not received a message from the city yet. I've been in sales for 34 years. If I didn't reply to it, I'm not calling us customers, we're citizens. They work for us. Been over two and a half to three months. No word. What's going on? Well, we told we have the best and brightest people. If we can't get a phone call, how can we get anything done in the city for the citizens? That's all I got. They got the address, they got all the info. They, they know where, where to send the water bill every month, so they got the info. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator. You got that address, Todd? John? I have it. Uh, Shannon's got it. Thank you. Ms. Graff, please. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. I too want to speak about public comments and to thank you for considering the whole issue of how you hear us. Um, just to come to this setting can be intimidating and you know better than I that in the last year it has been especially difficult for people to come into this atmosphere and speak with you seems to be much better tonight. And that's a good thing. Um, I know you want everyone to be heard and the city wants to be heard. And I'm just here to say that it's very difficult to legislate nuts. And that it should be the responsibility of all our citizens to um, set a tone that we want our city to be known by and to expect that tone from all of us. And I think we are willing to be helpful to you. Please ask us if there is any way that we can make your job easier as you hear from us. And then I would like you to remember when you are making decisions that there truly are thousands of people who are saying nothing because you are doing a good job and you decide best when you remember that we exist. And then I've been thinking since I was here last, what I should say to you, the street cleaners have done a great job of cleaning up winter and my street light came on every single night. And I believe that if you are managing those small things well, our big items are in good hands. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Graff. That's all I have. One of those people who can't quite get here all the time. Do you mind? Get on up here. Come on down. 
we're talking about it today anyway, so it might change. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, please. City yep. Council. Uh, I too am here to, to discuss the uh, citizen comment period. I've talked to a, a few of you independently about it, and here I am again um, because I believe this is such an important issue. And I'm going to kind of run through some things and make a decision how you feel best, but I'm hoping that. Um, kind of moves you to a, uh, a place of openness where the citizens can still feel like they're all part of the city. Uh, first off, respect and decorum in this situation, I believe, is paramount. It, it, it needs to be there. We, we, nobody's going nobody's gonna to disagree with that. Um, but sometimes you're going to have uh, an emotional and an impassioned group of people. And while you don't want anybody stepping over a line or being truly mean or disruptive, um, I think that sometimes that impassioned and, and a group of people is actually good for government. That adversarial part makes good democratic government. They're challenging the government. Now, obviously we don't want back and forth or threats or anything like that, but they're, they're challenging you by them being here to stand up and be the best that you can be. So sometimes those people are useful. I don't, uh, I don't want to see somebody get banned where they would not be allowed to come back. Um, that's the point. Like, I've, like I said, I've talked to a few of you and here I am again. Other people are here again. This is a pretty important issue. It's an important enough issue that I'm taking time out of my day and stuff to come in and try to reiterate that because I want everybody to know that. Why do people come up here to do it? I could grab my box, I grab my box and I can go down onto Demers and Forth and stand there and rail, but I'm not gonna really reach a whole bunch of people. This is the biggest soapbox right now. This is the biggest soapbox that I'm standing on. I get a chance to talk to you. I get a chance to talk to anybody who's watching, all the citizens who are here. That's why people are going to return and come back and do those things. This is the opportunity for me to try to influence you or influence them so that they can then talk to you because a hundred of them has more pressure or has more influence on you than just me. Um, gateways, I don't want to see electronics or having to sign in and stuff because some people have things that come up or agenda items only. You don't, you don't know what might be somebody's comfortable with somebody's, I'm actually a pretty good speaker and I'm a little nervous doing this. So it's, you don't want to have any, any barriers to allowing any free flowing information because all of that information, whether it's something that you're looking to discuss or something you may not even be aware of, but might be something that is that should be a concern for you in the future. We want to be able to allow all of those things to come out there. Um, same as people from outside of jurisdiction. Maybe you have um, somebody in one of the neighboring towns that knows something that's coming up or something that might be important to you and maybe they don't know the other cases or how to do this or such as that. So try to leave it as open as possible. And as you make your decision and you decide what it is you'd like to do, I really would please err on the side of access, err on the side of a strong citizenry that can hold government accountable and err on the side of the what ifs that we can't anticipate right now. We don't know what might happen in the future, and anytime you close something off, you might lose a portion of something that could be useful in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanderson. All right, with that, we will move on to three awards, presentations, appointments, and proclamations. 
3.1 confirmations include uh, national food week, May 14th, May 20th, the two cost break on Wild Week, May 15th, anniversary of Inswatch, Sir Cody, and Fulty, May 27th, Holiday uh, American Legion, October 8th, May 27th, and Child Care Provider Appreciation Day, October 12th. Great. Thank you. I'll probably go through three of the four of these, um, try to do it quickly. All right, we, this one's a joint proclamation that we have with East Grand Forks. National Police Week, May 14th to the 20th, 2023, and Peace Officers Memorial Day, May 15th, 2023. Whereas the Congress and President of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day, and the week which May 15th falls as National Police Week. Whereas the members of the Grand Forks Police Department and East Grand Forks Police Departments and area law enforcement play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of our community. And whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the duties, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices of their law enforcement agencies, and that members of our law enforcement agencies recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression. And whereas the men and women of the Grand Forks Police Department and East Grand Forks Police Department unceasingly provide a vital public service. Now, therefore, we, Mayor Brandon Bochinski of Grand Forks, North Dakota, and Mayor Steve Gander of East Grand Forks, uh, Minnesota, call upon all citizens of Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, and upon all patriotic, civic, and educational organizations to observe the week of May 14th, 20th, 2023, as Police Week, with appropriate ceremonies and observances, in which all our people may join in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present, who have faithfully and loyally more devotion their responsibilities have rendered a dedication to service in their communities and in doing so have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and security of all citizens. I further call upon all citizens of Grand Force and East Grand Force to observe May 18th as Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of those law enforcement officers through their courage, courageous deeds have made the ultimate sacrifice in service of their community or have become disabled in performance of their duty and let us recognize their respect to those survivors. To the survivors and our fallen heroes. All right, I'm going to save this one for the last. Uh, we've got Poppy Day, and then we also have uh, Provider Appreciation Day. Whereas Child Care Aware of America and other organizations nationwide are recognizing child care providers of this day, and whereas child care provides a safe, nurturing place for the enrichment and development of millions of children nationwide and is a vital force in our economy, and whereas the pandemic eliminated how indispensable child care providers are for the well-being and economic security of North Dakota's young children, families, and communities. Whereas child care programs, which are mostly small businesses run and staffed predominantly by women, are still recovering from health and financial hardships stemming from the pandemic, while they have continued to meet the needs of families. Now, therefore, I, Brandon Bochinski, Mayor of Grand Forks, do hereby proclaim May 12th, 2023, as Provider Appreciation Day in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and urge all citizens to recognize child care providers for their important work. The last one, I think, touches all of us, and I can't believe that the time is gone. We're already coming up on the third year of this anniversary, but uh, I mean, this is the ultimate sacrifice. This is what our police officers have to think about and their families have to think about every time they put on that belt, every time they leave the door. Anniversary of End of Watch, Officer Cody N. Holty, May 27th, 2023. Whereas on May 27th, 2020, Grand Forks Police Officer Cody, Cody N. Holty, responded to Grand Forks County Sheriff deputies' call for assistance. They had been fired upon heavily, fired upon by a heavily armed suspect within an apartment building. And whereas police officer Cody N. Holty entered the threat area to assist Grand Forks County Sheriff deputies and was struck multiple times by the suspect's gunfire. Whereas police officer Cody N. Holty was killed in the line of duty as he succumbed to his injuries on May 27, 2020. Now, therefore, I, Brandon Bochinski, Mayor of Grand Forks, North Dakota, Direct all city owned property to be lowered at half staff and encourage and request all flags throughout the Grand Forks community to be lowered at half staff and honor Grand Forks Police Officer Cody M. Holty on May 27th. Who, who made the ultimate sacrifice and service to the city of Grand Forks and let us recognize and pay respect to survivors of our fallen hero, hero Officer Cody and Holty. 3.2 presentation, historic preservation regarding 150th anniversary celebration and water treatment plant support. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bachensky, President Sandy, members of the council. I'm Susan Carraher. I'm the coordinator for the Grand Forks Historic Preservation Commission. 
Next year, Grand Forks is going to celebrate its 150th birthday. 2024 is identified as the sesquicentennial year based on when the city celebrated its centennial. I provided in your packets an excerpt from a manuscript published in 1900 that recorded the earliest years of the county and the city of Grand Forks. It indicates that prior to 1874, people with land claims for the most part were regarded as squatters. After Grand Forks was formally surveyed, the land was officially opened for settlement in January of 1874. We believe this is the likely source that the Centennial Committee used to determine the 1974 celebrations. So we wanted to bring this to you as the representatives of the city for your input and consideration for citywide celebrations next year. I also included in the packet a copy of the logo that will be made available on the city's website for any organization or business to utilize for their own events and products in celebration of this important anniversary next year. I have a second presentation for you tonight as well, if there are no questions on that first one. So the second presentation I'm bringing to you is the completion of a comprehensive documentation of the old water treatment plant. This type of report is known as a historic American engineering record or higher report, which is then permanently filed with the National Park Service. And I just wanted to share a few historic points of interest from that report. The very first water infrastructure in the city was on Franklin and Third, opposite the current facility, right where the flood wall is now. It appears on the Sanborn maps from the 1880s. A man by the name of John Lunzer came to Grand Forks to be the city's first water superintendent. In 1939, the facility expanded across the street where the current building is. In 1956, then Mayor Oscar Lunzeth, son of John Lunzeth, replaced that 1939 building with a more modern facility that would address the city's expansion to the south due to the population boom. He also negotiated the provision of water to the brand new Grand Forks Air Force Base. Two subsequent expansions reflect both the growth of the city as well as the response to federal requirements for water safety standards. The report details the significance of the building in a historic context, as well as the technical specifications of the building and its operations. At this point, I'd really like to thank the staff at the water treatment facility for helping us with access to the old plant and for providing first-hand knowledge of the treatment process to the author of this report. A complete copy can be found on the Grand Forks Historic Preservation Commission website, and we have additionally filed copies with the UND Special Collections and the State Historic Preservation Office. And one final point I would make on that report, it is numbered 18 in terms of historic American engineering reports for the state, which means that only 17 have been done before that and mostly on bridges. So this one is unique. It is the only report done on a water treatment facility in North Dakota. And when I was researching to gauge the scope of the work and the products that we would need for this report, there were fewer than perhaps six available at the National Park Service. So our Grand Forks report now adds to that corpus of work for future researchers who are doing similar work and research on other decommissioned buildings or changes to their own treatment facilities. So with that, I can just say thank you. Well, I would, can I say something? Yes. Quickly, yes. I think you are one of the unsung heroes that works at City Hall and preserve and history, historic preservation and quietly the work you do. Um, and your team does uh, to preserve the history of Grand Forks is phenomenal. I think we got one of the best in the states and not the country. So thank you for the presentation you put thank together you. today, but the ongoing work that you do year after year. I so, appreciate that. Thank, thank you. Man. Anybody else can beat that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So whoever, please. I, I, I'm not going to beat that, but I'll, I'll have a question. Uh, first of all, I, I love the logos you've proposed for the second oh, centennial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you have any suggestions for us, perhaps? Uh, any description of what they did in 1974 uh, 
suggestions for what we could do. That sounds like a great research project. Yes. <laughs> um, so I don't have, what I can tell you from the 1974 celebrations is that there is a souvenir book that I have in my office. It's very tatted. Anyone is welcome to take a look at it. Um, and it outlines the history at um, through the, the century at, uh, up to that point. So it's done in themes, sports, people, buildings, etc. cetera. Um, so there is a souvenir book that was done at that time. I'm sure that as we go through this process, we will find people who remember being uh, in the city at the time of those 1974 celebrations and would love to hear from what their experiences were. In terms of um, ideas, I think that just from some initial conversations that I've had with staff and with um, other organizations, there is no shortage of people who have great ideas of what we might like to do. I can tell you that from the standpoint of the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, we have a couple of projects that we're gearing towards. One of those is to make our website a lot more user friendly and um, accessible uh, to learn more about the history of Grand Forks. That's a standalone project. Uh, the second part um, that we're working towards is working with the history department at the university to uh, pull together 150 facts, historical facts about Grand Forks. And uh, 150 words on each of those. We'll be, be able to put those out throughout the year to keep people's interest uh, and keep those different stories top of mind. And then at the end of that project, perhaps pulling together that as a souvenir publication of, or digital publication of some kind. So that's just some of the things that our office is focused on. Um, I've heard other beautification uh, suggestions for different things that are happening around the city itself. So I think that we could use the sesquicentennial as a great opportunity to um, do some projects and be really proud of the community and um, proud of where we live. So there will be 366 days next year. I need 150. When would we hold such a celebration? Do you do it all year long? Or? I see that there's opportunity to do something incrementally through the year. If there once if, and this is sort of where the public input piece comes in. Uh, if there is desire to do uh, some kind of singular event, um, then a, an appropriate day could be found to do that. I, I think of the state of the city this last week um, might be one time to do that. It's a good time of the year for people sort of post winter, pre summer, um, that's one option. Um, so there isn't a specific date. January is what's in that publication and it's a little challenging then, but there might be opportunity to do things throughout the year as well. Uh, the idea of doing it with the state of the cities is, is a great idea. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kerr. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's do my presentation and opioid responsive. All right, Mr. Doolitz, we haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? It's been a while. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Bochensky and members of the commission, I'm Michael Doolitz, I'm the opioid response uh, coordinator at Grand Forks Public Health, here to do an opioid re response update as I was requested by uh, Council Member Weigel late last year. Uh, you guys have been busy this year, so um, now's a good time. Next slide. Uh, so doing a little bit of background information, looking at where we're at with uh, opioid overdoses in our uh, community. Uh, so looking at our four year, our four period moving average, so that's a, a yearly average of overdoses, looking at data from all two health system, we're actually at the lowest point uh, for overdoses um, that we've been since uh, basically late 2014. Um, so over the, over the last year, um, we're looking at um, less than or 20 overdoses that have actually been to the emergency department. Um, this is part of an overall strategy of reducing the number of times that people are having to go to the emergency department for overdoses. The emergency department isn't a good place for change to happen. It's a place to get fixed. And if you can get um, if you can get fixed um, you know, without having to go to the emergency department, that saves resources for the, uh, for the community as a whole. 
um, and um, lessens the risk that people are going to experience um, bad outcomes from opiate overdoses, um, undetected opiate overdoses. Next slide. Uh, that said, when we look over on the um, on the emergency provider side, we are still seeing a, a burden of, uh, of overdose in the uh, in the community. So in uh, 2021, that was really our peak for um, first responder overdose calls uh, was 71. Uh, we almost have that amount uh, looking into 2022 uh, um, with uh, 38 overdoses, and it's staying relatively um, calm in the first quarter of 2023. Uh, one thing that uh, has been difficult for us, um, as you can see in 2021, was the 11 overdose fatalities. I suspect what was happening was, um, you know, there's um, individuals who um, inject opioids and there's individuals who um, take opioids orally or use and use alone. Um, what was probably happening in 2021 was there was the introduction of the counterfeit pills that looked like oxycodone that had varying potencies um, that uh, was probably driving a lot of those at home uh, overdoses that were turning into overdose deaths because they weren't discovered. Unfortunately, we were still higher than um, you know than previous years in 2022, kind of carrying over that that fentanyl wave. Um, this year, um, there haven't been any confirmed fatalities yet, but I do. Um, there is one uh, that is pending uh, toxicology. Next slide. Um, and then one other piece that kind of uh, works into the discussion that we're going to have tonight is looking at hepatitis C uh, case rates. Uh, so one of the reasons why we put together the certain service program was because we had that large jump in new hepatitis C cases between 2017 and 2018. Um, and I am uh, happy to report that we have been seeing an overall decrease in the community um, looking at hepatitis C rates, not just from our programming, but also because of the increased access to uh, medications that can uh, treat hepatitis C. Um, you know, we have more providers in the community that will treat it and treat it more aggressively and sooner. Um, as well as policy work on making uh, making hepatitis C treatment uh, more accessible. Next slide. Uh, just so you know, the area that I cover as opioid response coordinator uh, looks at that selective, starts at selective prevention and uh, goes to the um, aftercare, including rehabilitation. Um, we have other people in the community that do the primary uh, promotion pieces. Next slide. Uh, so looking at, um, just some highlights of uh, some newer areas that we've been working in the past year. I'm not going to go over everything that we do, but some of the new areas that we've been working on uh, lately. Um, we started a partnership this past year with All, All Truth Safe Kids. We knew that uh, medication take back is a strategy that we could use um, to reduce um, overdose in the community and respond to the opioid crisis. But we wanted to uh, strike a balance. Um, we, we don't want um, there to be excess stigma related to pharmaceutical opioids. Ultra Safe Kids does a really good job in the community with uh, promoting their uh, opioid, or sorry, their uh, medication take back events. And so we uh, became a silent partner with them. We're helping uh, fund their, um, their take back events and helping them, and that's helping them to add additional uh, events in the community. And more importantly, um, you're know, working with Safe Kids to provide medication take back events that brings it through the lens of. Um, you know, reducing access to medications for children, um, which I think overall is a benefit to the community because inadvertent ingestion for, for children is probably the biggest uh, concern when we look at um, access to pharmaceuticals. Um, also on the efforts related to improving access to naloxone, uh, Grand Forks Public uh, Health through me, um, we uh, started um, as the state um, affiliate for an organization called Next Distro. Next Distro is a national organization that was put together to help increase access to naloxone. They were looking for a partner in North Dakota that would be willing to um, ship uh, naloxone to individuals requesting it in the state. They had a great system set up to advertise as well as train individuals um, on, on naloxone. And then um, those requests um, come to us and with the approval of our medical director, um, you know, we, we ship those out throughout the state. And then that, um, that component of my work is funded um, by the state opioid response grant. Um, what that also does is it provides us an extra way to reach people in Grand Forks County. So we have had requests to this um, in Grand Forks County and that's a minimal increase to my work. And then finally, it's also part of our, um, a, a, 
part of our advertising campaign, which we'll be talking about later. It provides one of the three easy ways that an individual can get uh, naloxone um, through our website. Next slide. Uh, one other program that we've uh, worked on over the past uh, year and a half or so, uh, the program has been um, running since March of 2022, as we worked with uh, uh, Chief Lorenz um, and the fire department to set up a naloxone leave behind um, through a phenomenal intern um, that we had um, who was a member of the fire department and also one of our, uh, an intern with our department. Um, so what that program does is if an individual um, has a um, EMS response to an, over, an overdose. Um, EMS is on scene with an individual, and if they're transported to the hospital, um, you know, then the people who are usually left at the scene um, to kind of um, you know, clean things up and stuff like that are the fire department. And so we approached the fire department about, you know, why don't we use this as an opportunity um, to um, provide naloxone to someone that we know has had an overdose that can uh, decrease the risk of that um, overdose happening again in a way that it requires that EMS response. Um, so um, uh, Chief Lorenz, um, you know, he, he pointed out that you know, the fire department's in the life-saving business, and so this really fits along with the work that they do. Um, and so we started that program. We've had 12 distributions since the program started. Uh, also looking at indicated prevention, um, you know, we got uh, guidance from Mayor Bochensky that he'd like to see an advertising campaign, and I, did, I thought that was an excellent idea when we saw the increases in overdoses in the community. Um, so we have, uh, we're in the second year of an advertising campaign. Um, we uh, focus really heavily on digital ads and social media um, as uh, kind of a good passive way and then uh, to reach people as well as uh, bar advertising. Um, so the uh, through off the wall advertising the people who advertise um, in bars um, and uh, we've had a good response of that good click through rates um, amazing impression counts next slide um, and then touching a little bit again on the indicated prevention side on the apc project syringe service program so i know that there's some people um, on the council who are um, who are uh, newer and so they weren't as part of the, um, the efforts to get the program started. So I do want to touch a little bit on the goals that we have with the program. Um, so we have three goals with the program. Um, first is to reduce the risk of, or reduce the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C through infection drug use. Second is to reduce the burden of overdose on the community. And third is to provide uh, connections to promote uh, better health as well as, um, as well as recovery and reduce substance use. So all of the actions that we have um, through this program, um, you know, meet, strive to meet one of those three uh, criteria. Uh, next slide. You know, and as you saw on the earlier slides, uh, we have seen a decrease in hepatitis C rate in the uh, community, um, you know, despite national trends showing increases in opioid overdoses overall, we've seen a decrease um, in op opioid overdoses lately. Um, and um, we have, um, had good uh, luck with getting people um, connections to treatment. So uh, we're now co-located at uh, Spectre Health. Um, so uh, co-locating within a federally qualified health center gives us an excellent way for us to get people uh, moved along um, the treatment continuum when they're ready. Um, so um, sometimes that's as easy as me picking up the telephone, calling up to one of the social workers or calling up to um, you know, one of the medical providers and saying, can you squeeze this person in today? I'll walk them upstairs and they say, um, you know, let, yeah, let's do it. And, um, you know, and um, I also get a chance to, you know, kind of see follow up when people come in and out of the building and stuff. So um, get to see some of the success that we see with our participants. Our program has managed to reduce down the FTE count. We're running with uh, about uh, a little over a half FTE. Um, we've served 212 uh, people, so our doors aren't breaking down by any means, but we uh, do uh, provide um, some really good um, access for individuals to have, um, you know, kind of an extra, an extra hand helping them, helping them up. So at any given time, roughly a third of our active participants are not ready for change. Um, you know, they just want to use uh, drugs more safely. A third of our participants are at kind of that pre-contemplation stage where they're, um, you know, where they're thinking about change and maybe, you know, they need a little bit of a nudge. And then a third of our participants are at the point where they're ready for change. And, you know, we just have to kind of lay that groundwork for that individual. 
and you know where they're at in that continuum can can vary widely. Um, you know, recently I had an individual who was um, actually the most um, you know, the person with the most visits to the program. Sat down with that individual one day, and she said, "I am ready for change right now." So we had a great conversation about it. Um, that individual was very motivated, and so you know I had a coaching session with that individual at that visit. Next time they came back, they had. Um, you know, basically the bag pack, bags packed and ready to go. Um, you know, there's also individuals, an individual from early on in the program that I worked with to get connected to medications for addiction treatment. Um, and he still comes back and sees me on a weekly or on a nearly weekly basis, just as a check-in to, um, you know, to let us know that he is uh, doing well. Um, I won't read all the uh, statistics to you, but I, um, you know, a couple of things that do um, stick out with this program is it's been a, um, a really important way for us to increase access to naloxone for the community. Um, we were able to receive naloxone at no cost to the city um, uh, through the state opioid response grant, and it does no good for it to sit in my cabinet, and this is a really good way for us to get it out to the community. We also get sharp containers out in the community and get people tested for HIV and hepatitis. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Oh. I think you overshot by one. Well, no worries. Um, so one other thing I wanted to talk about with the uh, syringe service program is uh, the syringe service program kind of tipped us off to a potentially concerning uh, change that's happening in the community. Um, so the presence of uh, xylazine is suspected in the opioid supply in the Grand Forks community. So xylazine is, is uh, um, it's a medication that's used in veterinary medicine as a, sed as a sedative. It's not used in humans. Um, it's very similar to many medications that are used in humans, but it's not used in humans because um, it has a tendency to cause soft tissue infections in random parts of the body. Um, but it um, has gotten linked um, into the opioid supply um, you know, through um, through an interest uh, you know, through a nefarious interest in uh, making the effects of opioids uh, more acute. Um, and unfortunately, xylazine itself can't be reversed with naloxone. So if you give someone naloxone um, and they're overdosing on xylazine and an opioid, that can help them potentially have a return of breathing effort. But xylazine itself, um, if you overdose on that, it cannot be reversed with naloxone. Um, there was a suspected uh, opioid overdose death in the community that based on the circumstances provided to me through the, um, through the service program, it does uh, make me suspect that that was xylazine related, but that is pending uh, toxicology. Uh, one thing that um, you know, one thing that we is fortunate about where we're at with xylazine reaching us right now. It's been on the coast for three or four years now, um, but you know, reaching us at this point, um, you know, we have the availability of xylazine test strips. Um, so they're um, testing strips. Uh, that we're able to provide to individuals that they can um, test their drugs with the first to understand whether or not there is xylazine in there. And they can, one, report back to us so we can you know, let other people know, and two, change the way that they use an opioid based off of that, the results of that test. So that is not something that we had available to us when fentanyl first hit the community. And so we are um, hoping to get the, you know, get the word out um, quickly about this and hopefully get, it, get better access to that, community, to that in the community. Next slide. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, finally looking at um, our treatment and recovery um, pieces, um, you know, we still have had a very um, successful relationship with Spectra Health. Um, community Medical Services has added additional opioid treatment um, programming into the community. Um, you know, we've seen ShareHouse added to the community during uh, the pandemic, so now we have access to residential treatment in Grand Forks, which is, um, you know, which is an additional, um, and it's well-regarded residential uh, treatment in the community, which is, um, you know, adding to our um, capabilities. Um, you know, we are working with uh, a partner, Agassiz Associates, to return to providing um, outpatient addiction care as, uh, for individuals at the Grand Forks County Correctional Center. 
And then we're looking to expand um, access to addiction treatment in the community through the uh, certified community behavioral health uh, clinic concept as well. So um, we were active in that during the legislative session. Um, and it does um, sound like we did make some progress during the legislative session. Not quite what we were looking for, but some progress that will uh, hopefully open the door to that um, in the community. Next slide. And then finally, the major emphasis that um, you know, that we're putting our funding on this year is on recovery support. Um, so overall, as a state, we've seen uh, an increase in access to um, sustainable funding for uh, peer uh, peer support and peer recovery support. Um, we've seen um, you know reimbursement rates starting to get added. Um, you know the um, the state put together the necessary um, you know training programs and things like that. And so um, now it's been a time for us to put a little bit of money into that. So we um, you know one of the big areas where we're investing this year is to establish a peer support program. Uh, at Spectra Health, um, as well as um, encouraging growth of other small peer support options in the community. Next slide. This slide just looks at our uh, at our budget for this year. Um, again, we are um, looking at improving peer support with a lot of um, you know almost half of the budget going back out um, into the community, and then uh, Grand Forks Public Health taking on uh, programming uh, when it makes sense for us to take on that programming. Next slide. Um, and, you know, I'm open to any questions. This final uh, slide just kind of, um, you know, demonstrates the, the, um, the needle that we're trying to thread with the work that we do. Um, you know, we're, we're constantly kind of bumping into different, um, you know, different perspectives and different, um, you know, different reactions to the work that we're doing. Um, and we're, we're trying to provide a really good service to the community through this um, to the grant that we're receiving um, and through the work that we're doing on a daily basis. So open to any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Dillitz. Uh, Ms. Wasowski, please. I see a lot of things on the slideshow about how to properly use drugs. Are we doing any kind of campaigns on maybe like drugs are bad, like the DARE program or anything like that? Uh, so uh, as I mentioned earlier on, um, in the, um, you know, when we look at that graph of, you know, the different uh, pieces of kind of the continuum of addiction care, um, there's the universal uh, prevention, as well as the, uh, um, as well as the, um, you know, universal promotion. Um, those pieces are not part of the work that I do. Um, those happen elsewhere in the community. Um, so there's a substance abuse prevention coalition specifically for that. There's programming that goes on in the schools. Um, there's grants that the school has um, received as well. So that isn't a part of the work that um, I do, but they, um, you know, they do work on um, not just telling people that drugs are bad, but also um, you know, looking at um, kind of the reasons why people might opt to use drugs and they have like a sources of strength curriculum uh, where they uh, work on discouraging that through, um, you know, kind of addressing all of those self-worth um, needs and stuff like that. Are these posters of like the go slow put up anywhere or like, children can see them. I guess I would rather teach my kids not to use drugs than go slow, make sure you're using drugs around other people, you know? Uh, uh, so Council Member Ozowski, those um, are, are those posters uh, would be put in places um, that would primarily see an adult audience. Um, so off the wall advertising um, works primarily. Um, they have some you know, locations throughout the community and they, they rotate out, um, but um, most of their locations are located at like um, places like bars and stuff like that. Uh, all of the online advertising is targeted to people over the age of, uh, over the age of 18. So um, you know, as, as long as um, an individual isn't you know, misrepresenting their age, they wouldn't receive that advertising. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Dulitz? Uh, Mr. Wagel, uh, Mr. Wagel, yeah, go ahead. Why don't you go first? Just real quick, uh, Mr. Dulitz, the one concern that I have is I see the percentage of needles that are um, returned, and obviously the the other percentage that's not returned. Where do those needles end up? Uh, so, Council Member Weigel, um, the most um, you know, the most common place where they would end up would be um, you know placed within a sharps container and uh, put into uh, regular garbage. Um, we do coach individuals on um, you know we want you to bring everything back to us, 
but if you don't, um, you know, you need to make sure that it's within a sturdy uh, plastic container. Um, you know, don't be throwing them away, um, you know, just in the community or anything um, like that. Um, the number of times that we get reports of a syringe litter are pretty small. Um, you know, it's less than a half dozen a year. Um, and, you know, if those, um, if those do come up, I, you know, I, I treat them as an immediate action item and I go, um, you know, I make that my next point to go to that, uh, to that location, um, pick those up as well as um, we try and go and rotate through places where we've had reports before and um, check them again. So that staff can allow us. Thank you. I, I, I think it's just a concern for me, um, you know, for giving out a large amount of needles and and while 80 to 75 percent of them are coming back so far in, in 2023, that still leaves 20, 25 percent of them out there. And um, in my experience, they I've seen it many times where they end up on the street or they end up just thrown in a trash can or in an alleyway or something along those lines. And um, we know kids pick up everything. And um, that's the concern that I've had with this program from the very beginning. And I share that concern, Council Member White. Vice President Weber. Thank you, Mayor. Um, over the last decade, we've gone through some periods where uh, this, this was an absolute epidemic in our town, um, alarming numbers of deaths, uh, and those trends continue nationwide. Um, several of your slides tonight point to a dramatic uh, decrease in, in those numbers. Um, prevention is always um, the most effective, uh, often the least expensive, but also the most difficult to, um, to uh, prove or demonstrate. Um, but uh, clearly, we've been doing something in this community uh, to, to change this, especially in, in contrast to what's happening nationally. Um, the city has been proactive on a number of fronts of public health with uh, the establishment of the LaGrave on First, a Housing First program with uh, the social detox, um, the, the syringe service program, uh, among others. And it, it, it seems quite apparent that we are currently enjoying a lot of success. Now, several of the charts that you uh, used uh, indicated just the first quarter of 2023. But if you look at the last four quarters uh, compared to previous years, we were experiencing some uh, dramatically lower, uh, dr dramatic decreases in these trends. Uh, let's hope that it continues that way. But I think that uh, it's difficult to prove, but it would seem that there's a correlation between all of the proactive efforts made by the city and public health in terms of prevention and these lower numbers. Thanks for your work. Thank you. All right, got just one quick comment on this. Um, I share that prevention is obviously the, the main priority. You can't measure it because how do you measure someone that didn't start doing drugs and starting them? Stopping them before they start is obviously the, the priority. It just gets messier after that. We talked about the demand side tonight. I think it's also important to point out the supply side with all these drugs coming in the community. The good job the police department does to try to keep these drugs out. Uh, unfortunately, we've got a southern border that a lot of these drugs are, are slipping through and getting up here. That's unfortunate. It's out of our control. But just wanted to give a thank you for the police department for the work they do on the supply side of this and keeping some of this garbage out of our community. And so. With that, uh, thank you, Mr. Dewis. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we'll move on to four public hearings and second readings of ordinances. Four public hearing on application for property tax incentive for monthly developments to address two attachments for the application of dollars. All right, thank you. I'll open up 4.1. Why don't we open up public hearing on 4.1? Anyone here to speak on 4.1 this evening? All right, so no one will close the public hearing period. No one will for comment or motions from council. President Sandy. I think uh, this uh, new development, I think it provides a unique opportunity for uh, a niche that is underserved in our community. I'm hoping that uh, uh, perhaps Enclave will be coming back in the not too distant future asking for another five year 100% tip. Um, I think uh, that this will be a good opportunity for our community to help move products and services throughout uh, throughout the region. So I will move it to you. I second. All right, thank you. We got a motion to second. I think it's also you know, worth pointing out tax revenue. This does increase tax revenue on the land and also building permit revenue. So there's a large building permit, 10, 
$12 million. That, that obviously comes down to the city's bottom line as well. So we got a motion to second. Do we have any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, two about carrying second reading ordinance to the executive way on the fact that some city members were on the second. All right, same format. Uh, open up the public hearing on 4.2. I'm here to speak on item 4.2 this evening. All right, seeing none, the public hearing period will be closed and open up to council for comment. Anybody got a reason not to move forward on this one? Okay. Got a motion from President Sandy, second from um, uh, Mr. Bean. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. 4.3 public hearing with second reading ordinance that he makes way on the file of the airport system. All right, the floor is now open for public hearing. Anyone here to speak on 4.3? Mr. Ripley, please. Mayor Bacheski, uh, members of the council, Eric Ripley, Grand First Public School District, certainly um, providing my support for um, uh, this. Uh, uh, land transfer, but at the same time, just wanted to uh, take the time to express my appreciation uh, to the mayor, to uh, city minister, Mr. Phelan, the city uh, council for the support uh, and the partnership uh, with the school district and our industry partners and all the other uh, pseudo government entities, including the, the EDC, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the county, et cetera, for the Curb Act Academy. I'm uh, very excited about this project and what's going to bring to uh, provide opportunities not only for our students within Grand Forks. Um, surrounding communities, um, but also um, adult education as well. So just want to extend my appreciation uh, for this and for the support both to this point and, and further on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. Mr. Phelan. Mayor, since Mr. Ripley brought it up, you will see, based upon this approval, if you do approve, you'll see um, a request to transfer the property at the next community, the whole city council, the city property to the uh, Grand Forks School District. And then upcoming in a similar process, growth plan in JDA, um, there's JDA property, which is the old holiday, and that will ask to transfer that to the Grand Forks Public School too. So you'll see both of those starting next week with final approval at both the JDA and the City Council. And then that, that whole area will be within Grand Forks Public School. I think there will also be some discussion. There is a street um, that will go in there. Uh, for drop off and that sort of thing. So there's going to be some discussions on infrastructure development in that area too. So that will likely come back to you uh, beyond the planning zone. Tonight. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Yeah, and if anyone was wondering why the airport, why it's called the airport 63 subdivision, is because that's where the airport formerly was. So Susan can probably tell us the whole history of that, but looks like she's no longer here. She's history. All right. Let's see. Uh, we got any? I'm going to close the public hearing now and uh, open up for a comment. Yeah, please. We just give it to them. This would be a piece of our, our gift to the CT Center that was matched by the state. So, this oh, is our okay. contribution to that Career Impact Academy. Oh. We got a motion to approve for Mr. Bean. We have a second. A second for Ms. Lonsky. Any further comments on the item? All right, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to action items. Um, item number five, let's see here. I know we had planned to obviously pull item 5.1. Um, we've got an action report. So 5.2, we also wanted pulled 5.4, 5.7, 5.8, and 5.10. So we've got a number that staff wanted to pull for further uh, clarity on the items. Is there any other items outside of 5.1, 5.2, 5.4, 5.7, 5.8, 5.9, and 5.10 that council would like to pull for further discussion? All right, so we would move uh, approval on items 5.3. This is a tricky one today here. All right, 5.3, 5.5, 5.6, 5.11, 5 5.12, 5 and 5.13. I did a motion on those items. I got a motion from President Sandy, second from Ms. Sosowski. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same side. That motion carries unanimously. So we'll be on the 5.1 Do you have those numbers? We're going to. Okay. City Council agenda format uh, consideration uh, attached is an email from August 5th, uh, First Amendment guidance, uh, citizen comment policy is attached, uh, agenda examples are attached from Grant Forks, 
Fargo, as well as there's a foreign article, West Fargo with an article, City of Bismarck, and the City of Minot, as well as the South and Fort Campus. All right, thank you. I'll open up to the council for discussion. Um, I don't think the intention was ever to uh, limit anybody's ability to speak. I think it's just to try to have the, the best procedures possible. Uh, I know we do have a, uh, the most liberal um, public comment period of the state. So I think uh, leading on that again will be great as we come through this. I know we did mention changing the time. I don't think there's a, there's a perfect time necessarily to meet. I know 5.30 works well. You see the council members up here were probably less than half. We've got uh, city staff. I think generally it's, it's, it's in the best interest of city staff to be able to come after work and do so at 5.30. Uh, we all make sacrifices to be here that time, both at work and, and uh, you know, personally. I've got three kids that are playing sports right now uh, that I'm missing and often miss on just about every Monday. Um, so there's sacrifices made by everybody. I know the county commission meets at 4 p.m. So I think 5.30 is certainly a much better uh, time than that. Um, with that, I'm going to open up to council to see how, how they want to move forward. Just I'll give some initial, more initial thoughts, I guess. I, I do think there's value in agenda items being talked about at the committee of the whole. Um, we're one of the few places that has the entire committee meeting every other week. Most are going to only do the first and third. We um, do one better. We have a meeting on the second and fourth. I think it's great to have agenda items spoken about at that time because that's the first crack at it. Having that prior the council being able to uh, make a decision on it is, is of good value. Um, I do think that there's it does make sense for general comments as well, just as Mr. Sander had, had mentioned. And whether we want to go back um, to having that at the end of the meeting um, at city council meetings, uh, there, there may be some value in that. And then if anybody is coming later, um, you know, on the general comments side, could speak at that time um, without a cut. I think that, that would make sense because um, you don't know how long the meetings are going to be. Those are my initial thoughts, but at this point, uh, open up to council for further discussion and debate on the item. Here. President Sandy. Uh, thank you. So um, I, I'd like to speak about Mr. Kalami's code of conduct um, that he provided. Um, I thought it was uh, a great concept. Um, I don't know if he is the original author, but uh, it had, what I think are reasonable um, expectations of uh, council, city staff, uh, general public. Um, the version that he provided is very specific to the city council. Yet uh, I know that we have public meetings, other public meetings, planning and zoning commission, uh, JDA uh, growth fund. Um, so um, I, in reading his code of conduct, um, and I would be um, happy to suggest that um, we approve this code of conduct for, for our community uh, under some edited version that is inclusive of all of our committees and public meetings that we have. Because I think the, the concept for being nice to people applies at, at all meetings, not just necessarily at the Grand Forks City Council meeting. So I don't know how others feel about that or if they had the opportunity to read the code of conduct document. There's only one page, but it's, it, yeah. it's relatively simple. Would it be, would you just change the wording to city public meetings? Public meetings, and then it later references the city council president. Okay. I, I, it, the same for the, for the, yeah, providing, yes, exactly. Yeah. Change it to presiding officer, and, and I think that would, that would cover it. And how would we want to adopt this as a, a particular city code, Mr. Gasset, or just as a policy? If we were to adopt the, the comment guide and policy, that something similar as what's laid out for Mr. Galani. Yeah, I was thinking about this uh, today too, uh, President uh, Sandy, in that we've got the, the policy currently uh, that was adopted by the council mm -hmm. about a year ago or whenever it was. Um, it seemed to me that that um, the decorum is is something that it's not necessarily in, uh, has the same level of detail as what Mr. Bonny would, but I think it, those are appropriate examples of uh, the type of decorum that would be disruptive uh, if it was engaged in it. The, the only, I, I just want to express one concern, um, and it's the, with respect to the discretion, um, because it, you can run into a situation where if you're opening up um, the meeting for citizen comments, 
the exercise of discretion could lead to somebody making an insertion that you don't want somebody to speak because of the message they're providing, and which would be inappropriate. Sure. Um, and and so I, I understand what Mr. Bami is trying to get at, but once you, I'm not suggesting anybody on this council would ever do anything like that, but it does uh, uh, lend itself to an argument somebody would make that. I don't, I, you didn't allow me to speak because you didn't like the message that I was being, that I was presenting. So, you know, um, my, my thought process would be is taking the existing policy and incorporating some of the language that uh, Mr. Kabami suggested, particularly with respect to the decorum provisions and, and put in those type of specific examples. I think those are, that's a great, great idea. And uh, maybe removing the discretion certain sort of type of, uh, language. I guess I, my question would be, Mr. Kravami, are you, uh, does that sound amicable or, or are you okay with that concept? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the goal was just to present an outline of ideas for the council to consider and the administration. And I think that, that that's logical. And my hope was that we would get, uh, you know, the city attorney to review it and find the best way to apply it. Great. So I guess, unless, so thank you, that's, I wanted to start with that, and I certainly if other people want to speak on that or something else. But Mr. Green, yeah, yeah. And, and so as I'm understanding it, that would come back with a change in ordinance, is that right? And that, yeah, I guess that was the initial question, is that, is it the policy, do we, we set the policy, yeah. Last year, whatever that was, did. It, the council voted on on that on that policy. So it seemed to me that that would be the same protocol that you would use for this as well. It would be a modification of that existing on that policy. policy. So yes. that that would come back and go through the, the channels. Yet we'd still be able to get public comment on that policy yeah. uh, through the, the process we're talking about. Well, we wouldn't have a second. Wouldn't be an ordinance. We'd go through second right. of an ordinance. But we could obviously, you know, you know. You're not voting on it tonight, we'd be able to have you know the item brought back in this yeah. more finalized form for discussion. Certainly, mm -hmm. I don't think what's what's posted when it comes to the quorum is going to be you know um, you know a, a, a highly debated item. Mm -hmm. Ms. Wasowski, please. Sorry, I should have raised my hand. Um, I do agree with Mr. Gossett on you know kind of just number two, the addressing the council part where the president would make a decision on whether or not a comment is um, heard. Um, I don't think, once again, I'll say it, I don't think we should change anything at this point. Um, we just went through this 10 months ago and we were all in agreement. And I feel like it looks like we're retaliating against the citizens a little bit when we start talking about um, even, only addressing the <clears throat> agenda items. I personally have asked for things to be on the agenda and I've been denied. I know other council members have asked for things to be on the agenda and they have been denied. So I feel like if we go down that path that we're just really limiting what citizens can say and what they can talk about. And I don't know, still, I don't know how we get things on the agenda. Um, so I would like to go over that, but I do not think we should make any changes at this time. I don't know, Mr. Feeler, if you want to talk about the agenda and the process for city council leadership and putting things on the agenda, you appropriate time. I will. Um, just for the record, I, I think on this last item, our plan would be, Mr. Goss, we bring it back to the next committee to hold meeting um, next week, Monday, and then we have five Mondays, and so you would have two weeks um, between that cow and the next city council meeting to contemplate. But our, our goal, whatever you uh, decide tonight, under a consensus, we bring back some drafts next week, Monday. On the agenda itself, um, I think the uh, city code provides that the mayor is in charge of putting the agenda together. Generally, um, I'm the one who puts the agenda items together. I work with uh, Sherry Lundmark and Marine Storset in, in finance. And so we finalize that on generally on a Friday afternoon. If there are items, um, most of them are pretty straightforward and perfunctory, but if there are items that um, would raise to a concern of whether they should be on the city council agenda or not, I do confer with Mayor Wachensky in this in this case and also with City Council President Sandy on whether and, and Council Vice President Weber whether they want um, that agenda item on there. 
um, because you are the elected leaders. And so um, that's a rare occurrence, but there are times when I do not put things um, on the agenda unless I'm told by the uh, elected leadership. I guess kind of my issue is if I've asked for things to be on the agenda and here we are 10 months later talking about the exact same thing, you know, and this is what our third week talking about this now where it keeps going on the agenda. And so I just find that a little odd. Thank you. Ms. Sosowski, what items do you want on the agenda that haven't been on the agenda? Other than I know you specifically asked to have Fupong update on every single agenda. I've mm -hmm. asked for things in the past. Yes, they have been food bank related. So not recently. No problem. Okay. So I'm just saying in the past, I've asked. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Sounds good. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about if, if we didn't meet your expectations because that's not, not the intention. I understand. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. I think I think the the idea of the advantages to having it on the agenda. Because the alternative is to do it under council discussion at the end of the meeting, right? But but at that point in time, it's not publicly advertised, so you don't get the input that we might want if, if we don't get it on the agenda. So I just think that's something to, to keep in consideration as we go forward. Um, and, and I just yeah, just want to make sure we identify because I think that's a better way to do it than have to to work uh, uh, to work, do a workaround or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, for the discussion, I guess we've got uh, a guideline here. Do we uh, we going to talk about uh, a little bit more on? I know, and this is not a unique thing. There's cities all over. I know Fargo and West Fargo are going through this right now. Um, Oh, Kyle, come on, guys. So there's other cities that are dealing with this and trying to make the best decisions on these things. So we're uh, right alongside them. Mr. Kavani, did you have your hand raised? Yes, sir. Just one other comment is just our policies and procedures on, I would say, how we manage it. I think that that, that might not be something for city code or ordinance, or I do think that we should internally spend some time on how we proctor the rules and um, I think that that's something that should be open to further investigation, whether that's a committee or something along those lines, but how we administer the microphone, how we administer, um, you know, whether or not things are put on or not uh, on the agenda. I just think we should have a little bit of a discussion uh, about that. All right. I guess, you know, to kind of get the meat of the substance here of this, is there some discussion the council wants to have? Uh, about changing when the city comment period is, um, whether the committee of the whole, the council meeting, I think that's kind of one of the major talking points here. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Mr. Uh, Vice President Weber, please. If I may, um, I, last week we had a, a six point framework um, that uh, seemed useful. We covered the main points of our discussion. Uh, there was a request that we consider them one by one and, uh, and, and perhaps have a vote, but uh, uh, with that, uh, I'll start the discussion. Um, the first of those six points was whether citizen comments uh, should occur during cow or council meetings. And uh, I'm, I'm disappointed by this one because I was uh, compelled by Ms. Leak and, and her comments earlier. And so I, I hate to start off by disagreeing with her on this one, but I think that uh, it's it makes sense for us to keep it at city council. Um, uh, those meetings are generally run by the mayor, but the mayor is the only one of us who is elected by the entire city. And I think that it's important for the mayor to hear those comments as well. At this point, I'm not interested in proposing that we hear citizen comments both during council and Cal. So uh, my proposal for point one is to keep things the way they are and continue to have them at uh, council meetings. And uh, I'll, I'll look for other discussion and then I'll move on to the next point. All right, Mr. Bean, you got your hand on the trigger, so. Well, I think I understand what you're saying. I think the dilemma we have is if I make the initial recommendation, like to have citizens input into it, uh, not wait till after we've made a motion and then have to do it at council. So there's a balance and I don't know quite what that balance is, but not having citizen input up front 
you know, we all maybe look at what's just happened with Poupon and that, but I'm talking about other times when the, which is the majority of times, when is it that we want to have input so that we can make the best recommendation to the council? Um, and it's probably not unlike other committee reports that come to the council that don't go through us. We, we planning is only the example. We can always go back and look at the, the recording or whatever we need so we can or ask questions <laughs> the council when they actually come to us. So I guess that's that's something that I think has a value to me is the earlier we get feedback, the better. I was uh, compelled by your, your idea when you first proposed that. Um, uh, but I'll use this evening as an example. Uh, I came in with a framework for how I was uh, thinking about some of these issues. Um, but already uh, I heard from a couple of speakers tonight who have helped me uh, reframe some of my thoughts. And I'm going to um, kind of advocate for ideas that I heard this evening. Uh, and again, I think it's important for the citizen comments to be presented while the mayor is here. He's often at, at Committee of the Whole, but he's always here at Council, generally speaking. And I think that um, having people hear our initial deliberation and then have an opportunity to come back and speak before we vote, uh, in fact, hearing them speak the night that we're preparing to vote um, would be uh, a very useful. And again, we, we do have to choose one or the other because I don't think there's value in having both. Um, and so I'm, I'm inclined to uh, stick with Council at this point. And following up on that concept, um, again, I believe that the best work gets done when we have personal conversations, not when we're coming and having a discussion at a council forum. And so often we will discuss topics at the committee as a whole, and people have a week to reach out to their council members or to the mayor or to administration to talk to them if they have issues with things that are on the agenda. So I personally, I get more um, value out of those personal conversations than when people come to the council meeting. So I, I, I tend to agree with Mr. Weber that sticking with city council agendas is what I would prefer. Mr. Bain, yeah, and I think I think in the larger subject matter, I I concur with that because you only you see agenda item, you don't have a chance to know it maybe until you hear. It. I'm thinking more of those personal ones where somebody comes with a specific issue that they're trying to get resolved. We don't get into that so much, but you know you got I don't know sometimes a question of snow removal or you get into something that's more specific. That's the kind of one where I like to have immediate information, but on the larger picture items, I, I understand what you're saying. One of the things that I'll be uh, proposing later on is that uh, we have separate uh, agenda item, uh, citizen comments, and then a more general opportunity, uh, because often, as has been noted, uh, some of the most important things might not be on the agenda, but citizens want us to hear about that. So I, I'll be proposing that we give both of those opportunities. Did you want to separate them and have agenda items off the top and then do general comments? So that uh, is yeah, I think that's, that's what Fargo was proposing, but that's items. what I didn't want to copy them, but mm -hmm. go ahead. I'll, I'll, so uh, I think it was Mr. Kabami had asked that we, uh, so either Weigler or Kabami had asked that we consider these individually, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and go through them quick and, and mm -hmm. lay it out there. So the first one is, Keep it at council rather than moving it to Cal. Um, the next is the five minutes. Is five minutes too long? I, I believe uh, uh, the, whether five minutes is too much or not long enough. Last August, we moved it to five minutes. We should keep that for now along with the point of pride <coughs> that we have the most open citizen comment policy in the state. And so I'm not looking to change the five minutes. The next uh, agenda item of those six points was, should citizen comments be moved back to the end of the agenda. And what I propose is that speakers should uh, speakers should submit an intention to speak card indicating their purpose in relation to a specific agenda item. And such agenda items should always be pulled because I'm proposing we do this at council. So as soon as someone says they wanna to speak to item number three, we pull that and that's going to receive a discussion. Um, and uh, then uh, persons can speak at that time. 
when we're getting ready to vote. Additionally, people can request to speak on more general matters, and those comments should be made at the end of the meeting. Um, by the way, I have no interest in limiting citizen comments to just agenda items. Uh, that's been suggested tonight. That's not my intent here at all, but we should allow uh, directly relevant uh, comments during those focus times that we uh, address agenda items. The, uh, and I'm almost done here, the, the next are a little quicker. Um, should citizen comments be limited to Grand Forks residents or business owners? Um, my proposed language is that speakers should be limited to those with direct interests in Grand Fork City business, such as residents or business or property owners or employees of Grand Forks businesses. Um, uh, and I think that actually um, direct interest in, in Grand Fork City business is sufficiently broad, uh, but we, we want uh, it, to, it's legitimate for us to put some cap on that. Uh, people traveling in uh, from several states away uh, feels uh, irrelevant to our work here. Um, finally, should uh, citizen comments be limited to agenda items? Again, as I've already proposed, we should have an opportunity for uh, comments directly related to uh, agenda items, but also more general comments. And finally, um, how should citizens sign up to speak? I'd originally thought eh, the system we have is fine, but after hearing uh, tonight, uh, I'm thinking that based on what we've heard, uh, there's some terribly important ideas uh, that are most relevant to the process and uh, signing up as such, I propose that we not limit the submission of speakers cards at any time. In fact, we could continue to receive speakers cards through the evening uh, up until if, if item three has been finished and we're not gonna go back to item three, but people could still speak to item three during the general period. And we would continue to accept speakers cards on up until that, that final moment when we're uh, allowing general comments. Uh, because I was uh, uh, moved by, by the, the comments that uh, people have a hard time getting here or uh, for whatever the reason, uh, children at home, employment, et cetera. I like the idea of um, not requiring the card to be completed by uh, the deadline other than the period when we're going to speak. So again, keep it at uh, council, um, keep the five minutes, um, uh, allow both comments directly relevant to agenda items and a general period after at the end of the meeting. Um, limit uh, speakers to those with direct interest in Grand Fork City business, such as residents or business or property owners or employees of local businesses. And then um, that we uh, open up the citizen comment uh, application process uh, through the through the evening. All right, Ms. Slonsky. Thank you, Mr. Rummer. I think we that makes it a little hard. Uh, tonight example, the meeting started at 5.30. Citizen comments started, I believe, at 5.41. So if someone's struggling to get here by 5.30 to fill out the comment card, when, when comments start at 5.41 or 5.50, there's no guarantee that they'll make it. Yeah, I think what he was saying is that they still would be able to do the general comments at the, there at the end, even if it was an agenda. But, I mean, you have to set a meeting at some time. And it's not going to be perfect for everybody. Was that your intention? Of that? Uh, so my intention was if uh, someone wish, wishes to speak to agenda item five, that up until uh, the time that we get to agenda item five, they could fill out a speaker card. Certainly, if they're not here and we were not in, compelled to hold that item, they, they might miss the opportunity and then they could speak to it at the general comment, but we would have already voted by that time. You're suggesting, so you're suggesting that we would essentially have a public hearing for any item that people would want to speak to. Yes, in fact, I think that uh, at any item we should say, um, does anyone wish to speak to this item? Like we do with the public hearing, I think. Uh, and then we're that, not, we don't have a consent agenda, then we're going through, we're talking about every item. So um, I, I'm not, I'm right. I'm saying you're wrong. You're just talking to yeah. I think at that point, what you would just do is, you know, if you don't have a card that's on one of those items, you'd have to work for Sherry's going to have a the gymnastics here of, of, of keeping this in order. Yeah. But, you know, if you got to that point where you're on action items and nobody's said, you know, put, sent a card and said, I want to speak on that particular item and it's not open for further discussion, that would uh, be on the consent agenda. So she'd have to ask, you know, have items pulled if they were, you know, on. On there, and somebody had come 
some point between the beginning and right. those that you're talking about. In fact, what we currently do is we accept uh, email uh, citizen comments. So someone could send an email asking for that agenda item to be pulled. And uh, whether they're here by that time or not, we could pull the item and they would have an opportunity to show up. Uh, Ms. Osowski, please. I think that sounds like a lot, Mr. Weber. I like them just at the beginning. Um, I do have a question about, you know, the people that would be able to speak then. Um, would like the Grand Forks Air Force Base be included in uh, the city business and East Grand Forks citizens and business owners over there that maybe we could affect? I mean, it's more than just us in Grand Forks. And we have like, really should be good neighbors. <laughs> Frankly, I think uh, uh, those serving out at the Air Force Base have uh, direct relevance to Grand Park City Justice, very much so. Very much so. Thank you. I guess Ohio, it, maybe not. I guess it <laughs> comes down if to. You hear about the base. Yeah, and I guess it comes down to, you know, that language. Um, I don't know what value that, you know, I, I get what you're trying to do. I don't know practicality that it has much value in, in, in having there at that point. Um, why not just let, leave it open? I think we've gone through a period where you've had some interesting comments from some people that were not agenda item related that were, you know, there to um, ask questions, you know, bizarre deposition type of things. Um, I think, I don't think that that's a, a normal. I mean, you might have to deal with it sometimes, but I don't think that's normal. So you, you got to try to, I think as you're setting a policy, understand that there's going to be some room for interesting moments. Let's put it that way. I don't know how else to put it. Um, my comments were primarily meant as a way to begin the discussion. Yeah. Frame the discussion. All right. President Sandy, your wheels are turning. So let's, uh, let's hear it. Yeah. I appreciate everybody has different points of view and different opinions on this, and they're all valid. Uh, and my opinion is no more important than anyone else's. Um, and so, I, and I understand that. So, uh, which is why I think we should vote on these individually. And uh, I'm assuming that some of us will occasionally disagree on these, and I'm assuming we're all just going to move on after this is all said and done. Um, I I do appreciate. Um, the folks at the Grand Forks Air Force Base, and they absolutely are very important to our community, and and they should and um, should take the opportunities to talk to the mayor and talk to myself and make phone calls. I don't necessarily think that the Grand Forks folks at the Grand Forks Air Force Base should get a seat at our table for our city business. Likewise, East Grand Forks. I, I have a lot of respect for the hard work of Forks folks in East Grand Forks, and I appreciate them. And if they have an issue, they can give me a call. I'm happy to talk to them anytime. Um, and I think that goes for all of the rest of you as well. I think if we are going to try to limit it, I think we have to draw a line. And I can't, I don't believe it can be wishy-washy because that puts myself and the mayor or the other presiding officers in a very difficult position. So in my opinion, we should limit, limit it to Residents of Grand Forks, business owners, property owners, people that have a direct, uh, who are directly affected by uh, the inner workings of what we do here on a daily basis. That's just my opinion. If people disagree, I'm totally okay. Well, I mean, we got six. Do you want to start with that one and have a moment? Do you on that one? Do you want to include extra territorial? Because obviously, we have inspections authority and finance zone authority outside within two miles. No, I don't. Okay. Um, do you, as a council, I think mean, we should move forward and, and start taking these one by one. You want to start with that and then the home first? Okay, so procedurally, we're, this is to rewrite the policy that comes back to us anyway. Mm -hmm. So, yes. we do get another shot at it. And, and, and we really should include the extra territorial because we do have zone jurisdiction there. You were correct. Okay, so you changed your mind already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess tonight what we're, what you, we're really you actually voting. asked if I wanted to, and I don't want to. Oh, okay. 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 All right, I got you now. 
So tonight, why don't why don't we make these? These would be how we want the uh, policy to be stated. So we'll go through these six items, which will come together then for final approval at a, at a later council meeting as a whole, rather than um, just as six individual items. So do you want to, uh, I guess, make a motion on what exactly now um, you're saying? Is there a general consensus that we should leave five minutes as the speaking time? That's again, we could probably go through that. Um, yes. I don't think we need to. Does anybody oppose that? I think at, at five minutes, honestly, I think a lot of people end up going even shorter than three. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's only been a couple of times where people have gone over five and we've had to slow it down. But so no motion needed on no that. Motion okay. Needed. So we need through. to make a motion on keeping the council comments during city council business. I think on that one, we just need to know are we do you just want to keep it as is where it's just at the start and it's uh oh it's less complicated. Before you start making motions, I think I just assume because I'm, I'm taking direction from the council tonight um, is to get some consensus as to what this policy is going to read. And then when you see the full policy, you so, can make a motion. Uh, if that, so if just, I'm, I'm concerned about a motion, what the okay. effect that. Well, why don't I just ask if this was, if there was a motion, how would you vote upon it? <laughs> work you, Mr. Bassett? All right. So what was that? Now I lost. So I would, um, I feel like we should keep it at council meetings, but I think that there's a separate discussion about when during council Let's start with council meetings. Is everyone on case keeping it up during council meetings? Mr. Bean, if you're not, you're welcome to tell everybody okay. why, why we should change. Well, I think I, I described that to begin with, but I, I'm trying to look at the balance because I can't look at one necessarily in, on its own unless I know we're changing or how we get the citizens' comments at the appropriate time at the next meeting mm -hmm. is where um, is where my question is because I, I, I do believe depending on the subject that makes a difference in which is the best time to potentially have it what that subject matter is um, or how to do it so I I think for the purposes of getting this through I would like to see what that verbiage looks like. Um, and I don't, I don't see that. So I maybe have a difficult time. So to keep this moving, I go ahead. I'm going to vote to keep it in, in the committee and you can see where the rest of the- put it in, Okay, so we've got at least one that is, is, is possibly like on the committee as well. Anybody else that was possibly like on the committee as well, if you were to make the motion this evening. Okay, so consensus is six, six to one on that one. All right, you got the, who's got the list on though? Uh, the next is, uh, should citizen comments be moved back to the end of the agenda? And my proposal is here that we should have, uh, the, the next item is, uh, should citizen comments be moved back to the end of the agenda? And my proposal is that we should have comments, uh, agenda specific comments, and then a general period at the end. So, which is the middle, middle ground on this system. would be, I think, speaking to agenda items um, prior to the agenda items. So if you put that in place, um, you went through the agenda and after right now we've got four as public hearings. So after public hearings, you put comments on agenda items. And then, mm -hmm. then you can speak to any agenda item at that point, right before the agenda items are heard. Okay. And then if you have general comments related to um, a pipe or a sewer line or snow removal, um, curb, curb, that would be um, at the end of the meeting, which we can all know, take and have an answer for the next time. That's that sounds very good to me. Yes. Yeah, anybody against that? I concur with that. All yes, right. I'm against it. You're against it. We got two against. What would you prefer to be against? I like it the way it is, where it's just all at the beginning. Why are we going to spend all? Why are we going to spend all this time divvying divvying up the cards and opening public hearings to almost all agenda items? I. This, this would be similar to as it is. It's just if you're speaking to an agenda, I, I don't think the time you meeting. Right before. Right, instead of it being right at the front, instead of then going to presentations, then going to public hearings, then going to action items, if you're speaking to an action item, uh, you'd speak at it right before the action items take place. And then you'd have, if you have general, so rather than, I don't think it would take any more time, it would just be broken up between agenda items and non agenda items at the end. All, all agenda items at one time at the beginning of the meeting. All non-agenda items at one time at the end of the meeting. I'm okay with that. I, I, I didn't know that's what Mr. Weber suggested. Okay, I thought we were going to like. Oh, no, not each agenda. Okay. 
I agree. I, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. If that's what yeah. you guys want to do, that's not a big deal. No, not for each item. Just prior to action items, I guess is where I. But we can put it earlier. I guess I was just thinking to give the maximum amount of time for someone to, to speak on that. We would have it just prior to agenda items as a whole for every agenda item at once, and then do the agenda items. Go through citizen, go through everything else that we're going to do for city business and then have the general comments um, before we turn. That's different than what I proposed, but I will like it. Okay. Yes. I'm okay with that. I mean, as long as we're not, Slightly. you know, eliminating anybody, I'm not I'm okay with eliminating. Okay. Got that, Mr. Is there anybody against that idea? Anybody online? Oh, Mr. Kavan, I don't know how long your hand's been up, but it's okay. Uh, I would be supportive of that. My question is just would we allow citizen comments from the same citizen? at the agenda item period to have five minutes and then again or would it be five minutes total per citizen i would say i would say yes the ball could they bring up then if they're only given one five minute spot can they bring up other topics during like just say they were gonna speak towards one of the agenda items so we put them in front of that then are they allowed to I, I don't think there is that many people coming that are speaking to both an agenda okay. item and a general comment. Um, if you come back and you start to speak about the agenda item again that you already spoke about, I think that's when you'd be cut off. But I, I want to leave it open if they do. I just don't see it happening enough to, to try to stop, to have to you know, stop that. Does that make sense? You have to worry about it. Does that make sense? Does that work for you, Mr. Kamami? Yes, sir. All right. Anybody against? Where we're at, and it's totally fine. Mm -hmm. All right, Mayor. Right. Yeah, Mr. Weigel, please. I my preference is just to keep it the way it is. Uh, my memory is good enough that I can remember from item number two to item number five what people have to say and be able to write it down or type it in my computer. And I, I think there's value in that too. My only thought is if there is you know a number of people that are talking about general items, the meetings can go long, and you can you know get your work done and then go to the general items separately. But I don't, I mean, I'm really okay either way because it's going to be the same amount of time. But we've got six that kind of consensus, gave us consensus. So let's, for now, as it's written, we'll, we'll keep it as we propose with vital, um, you know, thinking about maybe switching that. All right. What, uh, who's got the list now? Are we done? The next is um, uh, the, the tricky matter of who gets to speak. And if, if I may, I won't go too long on this, but um, let's be clear. The reason we're having this discussion is because I'm hearing from multiple uh, con constituents, people on the street in the grocery store coming up to me and uh, concerned about, embarrassed about the way citizen comments have, have gone the last year. I'm, we're having this discussion because the way we've currently been doing it is broken. It's not working. It's needing revision. Um, and because of that, we're having to, to make some hard choices tonight. The idea that everything is fine and there's no need to change it is, is not been my experience. And I don't believe that's the experience of the majority of our, our citizens. So that's why we're having this discussion tonight. And one of the trickiest bits is who should speak. And, uh, what has been proposed is that uh, those in the city, residents, um, employees, or, or business owners, uh, including the extraterritorial zone, uh, should be, uh, th those are the, the, the citizens who should be speaking. All right, I guess who's in agreement with that? And um, I guess a hybrid of that, let me just throw it out there and everyone can say it's a bad idea if you want. Um, you could keep that for general agenda items, and you could have comments at the end if someone's outside the community. But then again, I could probably split hairs because it could just be the same. But uh, all right, who's got any other thoughts or wants to? Mayor, yeah. Mr. Bean, where do students fit in here if they're university students? Mm -hmm. The residents. Yeah, the residents. They're, they're our neighbors. Yeah. Absolutely. They're instead of residents, yes. just yes. want to make sure they were covered. Um, some of you remember probably quite a years back, we used to have somebody from out of town who came in mm -hmm. uh, from a small town, about 40 miles from here, making comments that were not indicative of citizens of Vanshorts. And that was an issue for me. I, I didn't see how and why we should continue to allow that to happen. You know, I'd like to make sure we don't open that door. Okay. 
I remember that well. And that individual, uh, as has been the case with some other individuals more recently, added nothing to the discussion, any value. Okay. All right, so I guess we've got on the table right now, President Sandy's recommendation. Uh, who wants to, uh, I guess, have the counter argument to that? Ms. Wasowski, I see you moving your hand. I just don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got one in, in, in the opposition of that. Is there anybody else speaking in the opposition? Uh, of how President Sandy had laid out. Laid out. Mayor, I'm on the phone. Um, so I'm kind of indifferent at this point. I'd like to talk to some more people maybe before it comes back for an official vote. Okay. So right now we're down. Yeah, one item I'd like to add is that regardless of whatever we do, all of our phone numbers and email addresses are listed on the city's website. So regardless of wherever you live, if you want to reach out to any one of us, we're all available still through email or phone calls, which I still think is the most valuable way to communicate with us. All right. So so for now it looks like we've got five in favor of that, two that are that are either an opposer on the fence. So for now I'll put the right that as it as it's been stated there and then we'll be up for the discussion come uh, the next time it comes around. Was there any other items? The last item was uh, how should citizens sign up to speak? And uh, I was I was convinced that we need to relax some of those without putting a burden on city staff um, that we should allow people uh, to, to speak, whether they're here right at 530 or not. I think we can accept speakers cards by email prior to uh, meetings. But for that, especially that general session at the end, um, someone could uh, submit a speaker's card at any time during the evening. Up until right before it's spoken. I think we should get rid of the speaker cards and put everything online. So you sign up, you have to sign up 3 30 the day of a meeting, and it's all online. We get rid of paper. Um, that way, if anyone that's kind of. I think that's just tough because there's some people that um, you know aren't as effective at, use, at using. Um, you know, computers are going through that system. I know that there's other, I know Bismarck does it that way. You have to sign up online. Um, well, we've got one that's on that. Anybody else that kind of, that would like to see that? I like the cards. With the cards. The basket. The old fashioned cards in yeah. a basket. But what, what we could do is, is have anybody that, you know, does want to submit them and then say, I want to speak on this item, that we could accept that just as we do any other comments and have that as part of it with the cards, so. And don't we basically already do that? Yeah, people can supply um, comments uh, on them and they could stress that they want okay. to speak at All right. Uh oh, Ms. Lombard, you get. Uh, one thing of whether we're going to do cards or online, I get a lot. I've had a lot in the last year where people do not fill out the card. Sometimes their name's illegible. I have many where they don't list an address, which we require and ask them to do if they're going to speak. And they don't put a top. Okay. Uh, so that would be the other thing if there was a way to encourage those speakers to fill out whatever method. I can't get it right in two minutes, the record. Well, I and think if you have a requirement. Yeah, if you haven't clearly placed the agenda item that you wish to speak on, then you would move to the general comments. I think that's an easy way. But I think that should, we should require it's them to fill their address then, because if we're going to confirm that they Whatever address applies to them in our community or business, they should they should put it on the card. Yeah, I guess I was just referring to general versus the the agenda item specifically. But I think that you know filling out the card properly uh, should be the bare minimum. I guess mm -hmm. not that you're not going to do the best you can with it. Okay. All right. So I think. Uh, where were we at on that one? I think you got the general. Like, what was the last one? The comment cards that, that would be continued, mm -hmm. um, although you have a much longer period to be able to fill those out um, up until the exact moment, essentially, that the items were, were left talked about. So, all right, are we done with item 5.1? That is an actual change back to the way it was prior to our change last August, allowing speaker cards during the meeting. Yeah, which I'm I'm okay with. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think it's making it more available to more people. That's great. All right, Ms. Thorstead, I'm going to hazard to tell you to move on. All right. Point two, the expert report for the defendant. All right, thank you.
right, thank you. Mayor, President Sandy, members of the council. Um, the pension committee, pension and insurance committee did meet last week, uh, May 11th, and they were presented with uh, the defined benefit pension plans actual report as of uh, calendar year, which is our fiscal year in 1231. Uh, 2022 that report is attached um, with your staff report um, we had the discussion at the committee um, we did uh, take a loss on the year of uh, 2022 of, of uh, just over 10 percent um, we do smooth those losses over over five years um, as we also have been smoothing gains um, over five years to create a consistent um, contribution pattern so with that, um, the actuarial uh, value of assets, although the market value took um, a decreased actuarial value of assets actually went up slightly, um, showing your funded percentage of 78% on the plan. Um, I put some bullet points together for you in an email that was sent and also included with this staff report. Um, this plan is regarding the, um, the old, we call it the old plan, the defined benefit um, single employer pension plan that was closed back in 1996. Uh, so if you were hired on a city employee prior to 1196, this is the plan that you're on. Um, we are on an amortization plan of funding it over a 30 year period. We have 12 years left um, to fully fund that plan. Um, just some of the highlights, there's 381 people left on this plan as of the first of this year, 38 um, employees of which are still active. Um, like I said, we do smooth those gains and losses over five year periods. So um, the report explains um, that that's uh, how you look at this to uh, compute um, what is the recommended contribution, which came to um, $2,969,058 according to the actuarial uh, calculations. We do have a budget um, slightly higher included of uh, just over 3.1 million. Uh, the, pension, the pension committee um, discussed and um, made a motion to approve to make a contribution based on the amount budgeted. Um, and then also they had the intent, um, if the budget performance allowed to come back later in the year, to include also an additional contribution. Um, the concern not with this year's contribution, but um, the impact of the losses on future um, projected contributions um, that would come with this and try to stave those off a little bit. So with that, um, I am here for any questions, but the motion that came out of committee then was to um, receive and file the report and also approve uh, contribution of the amount um, that was budgeted of, of uh, just over 3.126 million. Um, like I said, with the intent um, to come back uh, to you later in the year for a possible budget amendment. I know we've got two members of the pension insurance committee as well as, well as myself, so three here. Uh, the whole idea here is this is a plan that has ended. If we think that the quicker we get this paid off, the sooner we have three to three and a half million dollars of freed up budget that goes to this every single year. The more we can put it in the front end, especially when you have a down year, the quicker we get that paid off. Right now, we're looking at 12 more years. I would love to see that paid off in the next next six, seven, eight years. Uh, other cities are obviously dealing with this. This is not going to the future now with what the state has done. We're not going to end up in a, in a crunch and have to deal with these defined benefits. But this takes a big chunk out of our budget every year. Let's bite the bullet, get it paid off as soon as possible. So that on the back end, the people that are in our seats 10 years from now are going to have much easier time of budget season you know, serving the city. So uh, we got great feedback from our other city staff members that were on. Um, they, they, they appreciate the city's commitment to, to fulfilling these obligations. Um, these are obligations that we do have to fulfill. And keep in mind, uh, there's no cost of living adjustments for, for the people that are on this pension plan. So, uh, you know, throwing that they have to deal with inflation and know that their, their costs are getting crushed. I think at a minimum, we need to make the commitment to, to fully funding this pension thing and doing this as quickly as we can. So that was, I think, the, the spirit of the uh, Pension Insurance Committee. Um, uh, Mr. Weber, I, don't, I think Mr. Wiley was there as well. I don't know if you have anything further as a committee member. I don't have a single thing to add to what you just said. I, I completely agree with everything uh, that's been stated. I uh, appreciate your leadership on this and move approval. Uh, we got a motion to approve. Do we have a second? We can open up for further discussion. Second. Second from President Sandy. And then further discussion on the item. President Sandy. Please, Mr. Said, I can't remember. How many years have we been working this plan? Um, we had put this on a 30 year amortization. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a, a lot of years of working toward getting this fully funded. Um, and we've been 
consistently, um, at least in my time period, trying to put a little bit um, above what's been recommended to, to get ahead of. But so I guess what I'm going to say is I'm really glad that we started when we did. Um, because obviously we're still 24 million underfunded in the pension plan for people that many people that aren't aren't working for us anymore. And they're, they're not paying in. Okay, they're, they're not paying in. So anyway, I really appreciate that fact that we had forethought. And certainly, we owe it to uh, to our uh, employees and past employees to make sure that their financial uh, uh, interests in their pension plan are secure. Thank yeah, thank you. And then we would come back in November, and, and uh, if there is surplus in the budget at that point, we would look for council to and we'd probably come back with, with finance giving a recommendation on that amount. Or, yeah. and, and I want to take this point too to thank you guys for um, always supporting this and and doing doing the right thing and and, and funding this and, and getting it on track. Thank you. All right, we've got a motion to second. Do we have any further comment? All right, seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Stark. All right, then 5.4 is the penalty of consideration. All right, Mr. Gosta, I understand this is going to take some further time. So if you want to make a brief uh, uh, brief uh, summary here, and then we'll move on. Well, um, after last week's meeting, I uh, had further conversations. I think I mentioned I talked to the uh, city attorney in Fargo. They're kind of going through the same process. Also talked to Ron Galstead, the East Grand Forks City Attorney, because uh, it makes sense that we're copacetic with one another uh, in processing and, and some of the rules and things like that. Um, in addition, um, given those communications, we met internally with uh, Finance Department, uh, Mr. Phelan, Police Department Engineering, uh, to address some, some issues that they saw as we're drafting this. Um, I won't go through the changes that we've already talked about in the open container view. I think I've already talked about that last week. Um, but one of the one of the issues and considerations that came up is these things are fairly slow moving. Um, and how do we address the impeding of traffic, uh, particularly like, for example, an emergency vehicle or things like that? Um, the area of operation. I know that Fargo is is addressing an issue where uh, one of the pedal pub operators would like to just pick, pick, pick people up at their houses and just drive around the neighborhood. Um, and that's an issue. Um, I think there's a motivation to keep it uh, centralized in downtown rather than across the, across the community. Um, the the uh, operation, for example, the driver, uh, one of the issues that was raised is should they have to go through alcohol training to recognize uh, if somebody is intoxicated and things like that. Those are some of the issues that were raised. Um, glassware and garbage that could that could uh, result from these things. These are always some of the ideas that your staff uh, brought to my attention on uh, good thoughts that we need to consider. So I wanted to alert you that that it's more than just the open container and the DUI uh, and, and drinking on public streets. There are other issues that are dealing with public safety. Um, I've also been told that these things are a little top heavy and they can tip if you're going too fast. So we need to be mindful of that as well. So uh, my role here tonight is just to advise you, to alert you of some of the issues that, that have been presented. It's gonna take a little bit longer. And again, I wanna make sure that, that we're consistent and, and copacetic and East Grand Forks is copacetic with what we're doing here and, and over at East Grand Forks because right now the only uh, provider is starting as I understand, starting in Minnesota and, and coming across uh, in North Dakota, but this can't be exclusive just to them. We have to think that there might be uh, somebody else that might wanna accomplish one of these things in Grand Forks as well. So just wanted to alert you that, that we're working on it uh, but it's going to take a little, a little bit longer than, than uh, I had originally envisioned. So. All right. Any questions for Mr. Gosta on this subject as he brings further work up, Mr. Dean? Well, it sounds like a lot of work that you go through and try to do. And I, I just start think, looking and hearing the public safety issues associated with this. And I'm very concerned about if we should proceed. That's, I think that's worthy of some discussion to not go through all this and then have it voted down. Well, I think you have to do the work regardless. I do think that there's public safety concerns and I think they can be met. I, I think it's something that can be tried, but uh, you're going to have to get the, I mean, I, 
I guess the, the question would be, do you want to stop even working on it? I mean, we can kind of do the work regardless, I think, and see where we land. And Ms. Wasowski? Um, I kind of agree with Mr. B, and you brought up a lot of good points that I guess I never even really thought about. But could we tootle this thing up and down the greenway instead and keep it off the roads? And I don't know if there'd be enough room on the bike path for one of these, because they, as I understand, they're about the width of a vehicle. I saw people driving their trucks down there on the greenway, so I don't know why this little trolley car would have a hard time, but <laughs> just, a, just an idea to maybe keep it off public roads, because I, I agree that that could be a huge issue, especially when they want to go and pick people up at their homes. I don't want to be going down Washington and get behind a trolley car, so a bike car. And, and Councilmember Wasowski and uh, those are all policy decisions that that you'll have to have to decide. I can draft language up, and and you can yeah, pick and choose which policy, which which way, which direction you want to go. Thank you. All right, Ms. Lutsky. Um, So I know they voted on in East Grand Forks last week. I didn't hear what they voted. I think they they directed the. Uh, I don't know the exact vote either. Um, all I know is Mr. Galstead and, and I spoke, um, and he is reviewing. Uh, what ordinance changes would have to be made in Minnesota in East Grand Forks. And, and uh, in my discussions with him, um, it was a great discussion uh, with Mr. Elstead. And, and I, uh, we both concurred, we, we communicate with one another to make sure that, you know, our rules, you don't have to change as you're going across the river and make all kinds of adjustments to get to East Grand Forks or likewise if we go forward at this. So, so the, the effort is going to be, we're going to communicate with one another. How much, yeah, I guess maybe we can let East Grand, since it's starting East Grand Forks, maybe they can take the lead and get a lot of these ordinances done on their side. We can copy, paste, and edit. Does that sound? I like my work product too, but that's probably a good idea. All right. Yeah, Mr. Weber, these exist all over the country, right? There's cities that have these. Uh, isn't it sufficient to just look at, and maybe you've already done this, look at uh, best models, best practices from other cities? Yeah, and we're already taking a look at Minneapolis. That was part of your packet. Uh, Sheboygan, Wisconsin uh, is also going, and I think that's the, the baseline that uh, Fargo is using uh, that they shared with me. So we are looking at other cities that have these uh, operations. So. My apologies. Good. No, of course. Yeah, um, please, or, and, and they've um, they would be based out of East Grand Forks. So the business license, the liquor license, all of those would be in well, East Grand there's Forks. No liquor, or, no uh, there's no liquor license, uh, but there's a business license, and that'll be in East Grand Forks, not here. Or will they have one in both? I'm I'm anticipating that we'd uh, have some licensing here in Grand Forks as well. So music. <laughs> Is there music? Was that the question? There, yes, there is music, and so there's noise ordinances too. So we have to okay. President Sadi, I, I apologize if I, I watched the abridged version of this discussion. Um, and so I was wondering what the discussion was about the, the trolley going over the bridge, because they, of course, are going to want to. They're going to want to be operating during prime times. I didn't catch any discussion about. Because six miles, we only there's only room for one vehicle on that bridge, and they're going six miles an hour. And and so, have was there any discussion about limiting the time of day when they can go over the bridge? That's I, I I'm 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 all you know I can be convinced that anything is worth a try, but I'm concerned that that's that actually might cause a problem. Well, uh, that would be another policy decision if you want to exclude at four to six p.m. Eight to ten, why I would imagine maybe would be more of an issue. I don't know if it's ready to pedal pump at nine a.m., but I've been wrong. Maybe yes. All right, no. we'll let that lie. Um, anybody, any further questions for Mr. Gaston? Uh, thank you, Mr. Gaston. Around uh, five point seven three. Uh, Ms. Everson, please. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, we opened bids last Thursday. We received four bids for this project. This is the project that we had to rebid because we received zero. So we received four bids and we're recommending awards to gas construction in the Mountain Student Staff Board. I don't have that pull up. What was the amount of the engineer's estimate? Uh, the low bid was 530412 and the engineer's estimate was 742 So. Oh. About 35% below And we got four bids this time. Four bids. So, what, how did we get no bid to four? 
were thinking that they maybe came up and realized that they are available to do work. We extended the uh, deadline a little bit too, so extended. Well, it looks like a great next good. year. Yep. Right. Um, we got a motion to approve from Vice President Weber, second from Ms. Losowski. So you know, this is a new company out of Fargo too, so it's good to get new contractors up here as well. So. All right. Well, you see no further comment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, project before you is an NDDOT lead rehabilitation project on 32nd Avenue from I-29 to South Washington Street. Approximately half the project is uh, asphalt roadway, the other half is uh, concrete. Proposed project is uh, on the asphalt portion to mill and overlay that. On the concrete portion is to do some concrete patching, small repairs, and then uh, for replacement and ADA work and other miscellaneous repairs along the entire length. The original project uh, was scheduled for construction in 2025. The DOT local district here uh, was instrumental in getting this project accelerated in 2023. Bid openings for this project uh, occurred last Friday at the NDDOT in Bismarck. Um, one bid was received from Strata Corporation in the amount of uh, approximately 4.4 million. The engineers estimate for this project was approximately 1.6 million. Uh, low bid was approximately 173% above the engineer's estimate for this project. Uh, the city share for the project as a bid is estimated to be approximately 570,000. Um, reviewing the engineer's estimate, the unit prices used for the estimate uh, were comparable to past bid prices that we've received um, in the recent past, including the Mill Road, Mill and Overlay project, as well as the, uh, the North Washington Rehab project. Um, it is likely that uh, the, the late bid, the lack of available bidders, likely resulted in this higher than anticipated bid. Now, considering the condition of 32nd Avenue and uh, particularly what occurred this past spring, um, uh, there's a desire by staff to complete this rehabilitation work yet this, this summer, if possible, particularly the asphalt portion. Uh, earlier today, I did have a conversation with NEDOT local district and uh, their staff is anticipating not concurring any award for the project or not concurring any award for the project and is uh, considering a couple of different options uh, to move forward. Uh, one of which is rebidding only the asphalt portion here in June and then rebidding the concrete portion, um, all those other incidentals, as well as a chip seal for the asphalt uh, in either October or November for construction next year. Uh, rebidding the smaller portion of the work um, is not without its risks. There's a potential that we could see even higher bid prices, or we may not see any bidders at all. Um, so it is, it is not without its own risk. Um, ultimately, the decision whether or not to award this project uh, goes to the DOT in Bismarck, their central office. Um, and staff's recommendation in of concurrence is intended to show the city's desire to complete the project and to financially support it if it is awarded. The anticipated cost share of this $4.4 million project is 500, approximately 570,000. And uh, with that, staff is recommending concurring in the award of the contract to Little Better Strata Corporation in the amount of $4,419,486.27, prove any necessary budget amendment for the project and uh, contingent upon review by the NDDOT. Well, I think this is obviously a tough pill to swallow, regardless of which, which direction we move. I think that the nice thing is that the city's portion, I think originally we were around 200,000, so we're only increasing by 300,000 for a large project that needs to be done. Um, I, you know, we're, if, if we go through any other route, then the DOT, it's, you know, that road's going to be in worse shape next year. And re, even if DOT separates the bids or rebids it next year, you know, that bid could be higher then. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's a tough number to see, but I think it's clear that, you know, you've got a lot of construction crews that are working right now, and to fit one in is, is a challenge. So that's a testament to just how much work's getting done in the area. But at the same time, this is important. This needs to get done. 
Mr. Bean? Well, I think there's some other things that are leading into it. You know, after the legislative session this year, there was a lot of money appropriated for infrastructure projects across the state. And it's well known that prices are going to be higher because there's so much work going on in the limited number of people. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is this is a rehabilitation project. Probably it should be replaced instead of rehabilitated because it's only going to last for 10 years. We're going to do it over again. Problem is, is that's going to that's probably a $40 million project versus a four million. I mean, so this is I'm just throwing that number out, but I mean it, it's super expensive. So um, and that road is bad. It just it's it's just a danger out there on that road, like we had this spring and will continue to have. So I under, I understand that those numbers are up, outrageous, but I'm still probably in support of the staff recommendation. The DOT probably won't do it anyway, but I just think that from the perspective of the, of the condition of the road, you know, people don't realize that we put together a sales tax that we're supposed to use to, to take care of our roads. And then you go out here and you see the road and it's terrible. Um, it's not a good indicator of, of the condition of our roads and how well we're spending our money. So I know it's a lot of money to, to, to spend that may not go through, but I think the alternatives are worse than this. Uh, Ms. Lonsky, please. Can you explain to so the DOT said no to this project, but we're recommending to go forward with it? In my conversations with the DOT local district, so the local district is the Grand Forks district uh, of the DOT. Um, they are likely to put forward a non-concurrence uh, to award the bid. So ultimately, it's going to go back to the DOT and central office in Bismarck to ultimately decide but the local office here in Grand Forks is considering not to concur. So even if they don't concur and it goes to the state, they will have to make their decision. And they may have, they may see these bids from all different cities looking exactly the same, and, and then their decision is going to have to be able for it. That's what I'm afraid of. Every city is probably going through the same thing. And they've got to have the money themselves. Yeah. You know, it's got to come from someplace. Well, I think it, yeah, I mean, at this point, I you know, this corridor is, is not business highway 81 it is a state and the dot road i mean i think we've got to concur with what we've got here and, and let the let the state make their decision and we'll have to pick up the pieces I mean, we've got to do something president sandy please just mayor i'm going to vote no because i don't think the state should go forward with it because i think they should rebid it this fall however if they decide to go forward with it i'll be very grateful that it gets done Okay. I, uh, here's what I know is that room was really bad this year and we patched up the, the potholes. And so from now until next year, it's at least usable. We'll have a lot of potholes again next year if they wait to, and, and don't do it until next year. But we, we, we dealt with it this year and we can deal with it next spring as well, in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's not an easy one, those are, you know. Mr. President, uh, Vice President, where we yeah. How many sides of your mouth do you have on there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to vote no, but I hope it happens. Yes. Right. All right. Now so you want, all, all of them. you want us to vote yes? And Great. So you can vote no, and then hope that it goes <laughs> through. <laughs> well, you're wrong. Either way, you're either, either, you're either fully right or fully wrong. Right. I mean, might look at it. So we need you to decide on that. So can I make a motion to approve the staff correctly? All right, we've got a motion to approve. Do we have a second before we take further comments? You don't want to second that motion. I'll second. We have a second for Mr. Weigel. So we do have a motion. We do have a second. Um, any further comments on this item? Ms. Lunson, please. Where will the extra funds that Grand Forks has to commit come from? Uh, that will come out of Fund 4815 as part of that uh, budget amendment. And uh, it'll be cash carryover. I'm sorry, it'll be uh, cash carryover. Cash from the previous year that wasn't business. Yeah, business. Our, yeah, our sales tax is also part of the problem is the law of diminishing returns. There's so much because we have so much money, we're doing so many more projects that we're actually driving the cost of the projects up ourselves. So, All right. so it's fewer projects. <laughs> yeah, but the roads are getting done. All right, with that, um, I'll be looking for a vote on the motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. same sign. Aye. All right, I believe that will leave us with a 14 vote tonight with uh, once consent descending.
All right, this is a lot, uh, a lot nicer bit opening. This one uh, was for Loon Park, which includes uh, redoing the pavers, adding some storm sewer to the area to help drain. Uh, this is a pocket park that is uh, known for uh, holding water, especially after a rain event. Uh, bids for this were received on May 11th. Two bids were received and open. Low bid for this one was uh, from Hop Construction, the amount of uh, just under 190,000. Uh, bid was approximately half a percent over engineer's estimate of uh, approximately 189,000. Um, and with that, staff is recommending award the contract to the low bidder off construction in the amount of $189,745 for alternate two and approve any necessary budget amendment uh, for project 8547 park improvements. All right, approval. We got a motion to approve and we've got a second. So, Vice President Weber and President Samuel, second. So, you're, you're, I see what you're sandwiching a good bid with a bad bid. It's good. <laughs> that, that's why we got another bad bid coming next. But, but any further discussion on this item? Yeah, Ms. Lonsky. And that includes landscaping in Loon Park, also, correct? Uh, I believe that does. Uh, Meredith probably knows a little bit more about that project and some of the more in, intricate details. It's relatively minimal landscaping, mostly grass. Well, I know those low line bushes look terrible the last 10 years. Right. Those can be ripped out. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll be replaced with something grass or something that looks nice. The folks who do most of the downtown maintenance would like to try grass. Um, if it works, great. If it's too shady, too much traffic, then we'll be back to so yeah. an alternative yeah. landscaping yeah. materials. All right, any further comments on the item? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. 5.10 bidding works at Project 8677, the Counselor Foundation Foundation. Well, as the mayor said, this is another one of those where the bids didn't go so well. Um, bids were opened on May 11th. The budget for the project was 500,000, which included A and E fees, and we received one bid um, that was for $1,081,200. Um, again, we didn't get lucky like the previous project, which was right on the money with the engineer's estimate. So in this case, the staff recommended actions to reject the bids. Um, we do have. Dale Bourbon from WFW, if you have any questions on kind of the technical side. But the idea is that um, for this year, we would obviously not go through with the fountain reconstruction, but use those basins to hold potted plants, um, look at ways to um, highlight that paddle wheel structure, maybe with lighting, and then work with our partners in DDA and others at um, prioritizing some projects that would use the, the funds that will not be going to this fountain reconstruction, which is um, approximately three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Thank you. I think it was, you know, really borderline, but it was it was a project that I think at five hundred thousand would have made sense. I think at this price, it just doesn't. Um, I think we got to re reimagine that. Um, do you have something, Ms. Sosowski, Please. I was just going to ask, like, can we rebid this later? Like, maybe in a year or two, and maybe things will come down. That's absolutely an option. I love the battle wheel. Well, so. it's, it's one of those things when we come back with alternate uses, then at that point you could decide, well, do you want to just, you know, hold okay. those dollars and, and hope that we get better bids? Um, you know, as has been said, it's, contractors are busy and this was a bit of a late in the season bid. How long will that continue? Will we get better bids next year? It's anybody's guess, but certainly a possibility. Thank you. How long do you think we got the EDA funds sitting there? Do we have some time? We're going to rebid this next year. We've got something much closer than you Do we have some time on that? Right. Or There's no um, back? Okay. use it or lose it sort of timeline. Okay. Time. So, yeah. Oh, okay. The do nothing option in this case is viable. Okay. But regardless, this has to go towards a project in this part of our downtown. Uh, Right. Okay. I, I was just going to add a lot of times contract this late in the year, they have to basically pay for it on overtime because they have people already working. And so looking at it again in another year, probably. And I like the idea of getting some potted flowers and you know, spruce it up a little bit in the meantime. I don't think that's going to take up a lot of cost. If that's overbid next year, I'll go out there with a shovel and help. 
Oh, right. It's it's a pretty low cost alternative that will look intentional. Sounds good. Um, anything further? We got that. We got WW uh, represented back there. Are we on the right track? All right. In that case, Katie, we we move to reject the bid. I second. All right. Um, President Sandy motions to reject the bid and follow staff recommendation. Ms. Osowski seconds that. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed to sign, that motion carried unanimously. I believe that's it for action items this evening. See if I can pull my agenda back up. All right, we've got a number of uh, information items. So if you want to uh, go ahead and rattle those off, we'll have them uh, filed. I will do that. First one, 6.1 statements of changes in cash balance as of March 31st. 6.2, the end of the portfolio summary as of April 30th. 6.3, specification computation plan update, uh, effect presentation. 6.4, the downtown progress update. 6.5, Memorial Village 2 project update. And 6.6, utility energy project update. All right, thank you. Received and filed. Uh, moving on to seven approval of minutes and bills. And the letter list of the one to ask the Senate. Got a motion. Pay the bills. We have a motion from President Sandy, second from Ms. Oselski. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Motion to approve as is. Are any changes made to the minutes? Got a motion to approve as is from Ms. Lonsky, second from Ms. Oselski. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. On to eight, city administrator comments, Mr. Phelan. I have uh, three meetings I want to make you aware of. Uh, on Thursday, May uh, 18th, and I know this is mentioned at 2 p.m., there, there is the North Valley Police Week Memorial Ceremony, and that's at Optimus Park at 4601 Cherry Street. I'll send you an invite on that. That's where uh, U.S. City Council did contribute funding for that memorial, and they're going to dedicate that um, as part of their police week, too. So I'll send you a, and please uh, attend if you can, and there will be a ceremony there. Um, number two. We have a local government advisory committee on Monday, May 22nd at 4 p.m. here at the Hive. And we're gonna be discussing Memorial Village Project in Baby Energy. And so you'll be there with your colleagues of the Manville Public School, Grand Forks Public School, uh, Grand Forks County, and the Grand Forks Park District um, regarding those uh, particular projects. Um, we'll, I will plan to send out a uh, staff report and recommendations on both those. and. We will have a presentation on both of those um, particular projects. Um, Mr. Can you repeat that date? Sure. On the first one? Monday. 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 Yeah. And I'll send you out this out in writing too. So, um, and again, this council generally with consensus um, um, provided that Danny Weigel would replace a council vice president Weber on our, our two member team with council president Sandy. So he will be representing you. And then finally, because of this position, he's chair of the group. Yeah. And so, and he's just replacing me for that. Uh, just for that. Yep. For, for everything. <laughs> for everything. Sorry. We all get replaced. Um, and then finally, there is, we are still on for the joint meeting with the park district regarding the uh, quality of life disability study that should be on your, on your calendar to do. And that's Monday, May 30th. And we're going to plan that at 5 p.m. That is your fifth Monday, or I guess it's your fifth Tuesday because um, there's a holiday on Monday. So on Tuesday, um, here at the Hive at 5 p.m. Um, after Memorial Day, we will be having the consultant will be here providing a briefing. And, and as the mayor talked about in, in State of City, trying to get to action um, will be a priority um, at, um, as we review that particular study. Haven't seen a draft final report yet, but it um, is supposed to be coming soon. And then finally, I asked Sharon, uh, Sharon um, wants to talk about spring cleanup week one more time, just to reiterate. Um, some of the specific some things that have changed this year from um, prior years. So Sharon, give us the one, two, three. And if you're looking for more volunteers, certainly anybody that wants to come out with me is more than welcome. I'll bring an extra pair of gloves. Absolutely. Always looking for volunteers. Um, mayor and, and council members, there were a couple changes this year to spring cleanup schedule, and that is it is berm set only this year. There are very few exceptions to that. Um, the people that do have exceptions to that should have gotten a letter or will be notified about that. The other thing is it's going to be picked up on your street ordinance day. In the past, it's always been your garbage collection day. This year, it is street ordinance day because we're picking up on the berms. And on street ordinance day, the vehicles aren't parked on the berms. So that way, it'll give us a better ability to collect those. 
And on secondary roads, we will actually put in road closures so that we can safely get those items off the ground. All right, well, thank you for correcting that because I've been telling everyone garbage week but garbage day, but uh, <laughs> either way, get the stuff out there. Yes, thank you. I have honestly have no idea what my street line is there. Look at the sign. There's no sign in there. All right, they'll pick yours up any day. All right. All right. Uh, is that's it for city administrator comments? Is there a place people can go to see? I guess now that we're on this, see what their street ordinance says. Is. is it on the website? It is on the website or on the GM 311 app. Yeah, on the 311 app or on the website, you can check to see what your street ordinance says. All right, we'll move on to uh, council members and mayor comments. Mr. Weigel, any comments this evening? No, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Osowski. Um, I guess my only comment would be to those wonderful young adults who spoke about the foster children. Um, it must be terrifying to be moved from home to home like that. And so, you know, just donating things that might make it a little bit easier for those children's transactions. I hope that, you know, lots of people contributed to that. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Osowski. Ms. Lonsky. Um, I have a couple things. Uh, tomorrow is election day, so I encourage everyone to get out. Uh, Lair Center, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., voting on Valley Middle School. Um, and then also this week is the Phoenix Elementary Safety Study Public Input Meeting. It's on Thursday from 3.30 to 5.30. Uh, you're not asked to stay the whole time, but please come tell your stories. I know I've, a lot of people have told me their stories, but I encourage you to come to Phoenix. Uh, it's about walking, biking, drop off, all that fun stuff around Phoenix Elementary. Um, and then I was also going to mention the donations from earlier too. If you um, are struggling to find a place to give those donations for foster kids, uh, please contact me and I can get you in touch with the correct people. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Lonsky. Uh, Mr. Dean. Yeah. All right, Vice President Weber. Um, uh, congratulations to Sierra Johnson from planning on uh, her uh, you know, a master's degree. She graduated with a master's degree this week um, and uh, reiterate uh, an important vote for our community tomorrow. Uh, go out to the Alaris between 7 and 7. That's all I've got. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, President Sadi. Um, <clears throat> I think that we should plan a monthly party for our 150th anniversary celebration. I think we should do something one day every month next year. I don't know what it is, but I think we should really try to do it as well. Um, certainly, uh, thanks to all the men and women in blue and for everything that you do. And, and uh, our thoughts are always with the Holton family. Um, and uh, we've already touched on the youth commission. I, I, I have to say for the folks that didn't go to the state of the city, um, and, and I wasn't aware of it until my son showed me the music video that was done um, for the state of the city. It's really well produced and really fun. And I think uh, it's out on the city's social media. And so people should go check it out. I think it does a good job of highlighting a lot of the fun things that have gone on and, and, and are going on. And, and Mr. Mayor, if that was your idea, it was, it was brilliant. It was great. I have one good idea here. Once a year. Yeah. And the star in that video. <laughs> <laughs> Up and cover there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paint. Thank you to Paint the Town for putting that together with the images. Yeah, that was great. Um, last thing, and I know we got a little bit of sunlight left, just want to make people aware on Thursday, uh, prior to the National or the uh, Northern Valley uh, Officers Memorial, there will be a, a day of prayer. We're going to celebrate that and have a prayer breakfast uh, downtown at Cloud Nine. Uh, myself and Mayor Gander always attend that, as well as other community leaders. So um, if it's something that you'd be interested in, 7 30 a.m. Um, at Cloud Nine on Thursday. Uh, go to Eventbrite and sign up uh, at a minimum and get free breakfast and uh, we lift it up in spirit. So please attend if, you're, if you if you wish. With that, I'd be looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion to adjourn for Ms. Osowski and second, second for Ms. Longby. All those in favor signify. Aye. 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 Aye.